Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, we might kick off this afternoon's proceedings. Um, in this strange, very COVID world, it does look a little strange to be standing in a theatre with not an awful lot of us and lots of spaces between seats, but there are also lots of people online, so we'll, we'll kick off the program. Um, first of all, for those of you who haven't met me, my name's Peter O'Halloran. Uh, for my sins, I'm the Chief Information Officer for ACT Health, um, and thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Um, I'd like to start this afternoon by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land we're meeting on today, the Ngunnawal people. I'd like to acknowledge and respect their continuing culture and the contribution they make to the life of this city and this region. Um, to, to start us today, I'd like to introduce uh, Wally Bell to you all. Those of you who haven't met Wally before, he's a Ngunnawal elder um, who's going to welcome us to his country. Um, Wally's clan group of the Yar people from Yass. Uh, despite coming and spending time with people like us, Wally is also very busy with a range of other things uh, and is the director of the Buru Ngunnawal Aboriginal Corporation uh, and consults with federal, state and territory governments regarding Ngunnawal Aboriginal cultural heritage management. So without further ado, Wally, can I ask you to come up and welcome us? I make a bit of noise. I use my clap sticks for that. And I call for the spirits to come and join us. Oh, these things sound better outside, I can tell you. That's it. Okay, here we go. Because I, I do so much cultural heritage work, I'm out on country a, a fair bit of the time, um, and I have a really good connection with my country. I can feel the presence of those spirits now with us. Um, yeah, pretty pretty good presence, I can tell you. Uh, hopefully, you guys can feel some of that as well. Uh, give you a good feel for country if you do. <laughs> Um, like I said then, the spirit of the land's now going to look after you as you're walking around on country. Um, make sure that nothing physical will happen to you. And right at this very instant, our ancestral spirits are going around everybody, looking at your auras, making sure there's no bad spirit there. So, but if they do find that stuff, they just grab hold of it. Toss it off country, get rid of it, we don't want it here. But the spirits then do ask that you do two things while you're on country. First one, the important one, respect this place that you're in. Look after it and care for it, as we have done for thousands of years. Second thing they want you to do, again, respect and be kind and courteous to other people that you meet while you're on country. If you do these two things for us, the spirits will then harmonise with your stay on Nunawal country. So may the spirits be with you today, tomorrow and for always. I'll uh, 
finish with some uh, words in Nunu language. Daroa Nunna, Daroa Nunawal. Yangu, Nilawili, Dunamayan, Naraganawali. Yomalundi. This land is not all land. Today we come together to sit and talk. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Wally. That was really very inspirational and educational. So thank you so much for welcoming us to your country. Um, and we will take care of it. Good afternoon, everyone. For those of you who are just joining us, um, first of all, thank you again to Wally for that uh, lovely welcome to country. A um, few bits of housekeeping, and then we'll kick off the, the day. Um, I'd like to, first of all, welcome all of you here. Um, this is a really exciting time for the ACT public health system, and I'm so glad to have each and every one of you here on this journey with us. Um, in particular, I'd like to uh, acknowledge uh, Kylie Jonathan, the Director General of ACT Health, uh, watching us online along with a few hundred other staff, uh, Barb Reed from Calvary Public Hospital Bruce, uh, and Bernadette McDonald from Canberra Health Services. Um, the joy of COVID is we can't all be in the same room together, um, so I really do thank everyone who's joining us both here and online. Uh, the recordings today, of course, are being live streamed and we have over 400 people watching us. Uh, they are also being recorded for those who can't be available at this point in time or those who want to watch my bad jokes in again. I promise you, you don't. Um, if you're in the, the facility here at ANU, there is Wi-Fi if you don't already have access to the internet. Uh, if you access the ANU Secure um, Wireless Network, the username is ACT underscore health and the password is Symposium 2021. Um, the first chest is can you spell symposium without cheating. Um, other housekeeping matters, um, we have a break, a comfort break around four o'clock. The toilets are straight out the doors across the uh, foyer near the cloakroom. Uh, also noting, of course, uh, we are adhering to ANU's COVID safe plan. So please ensure wherever we're sitting that we try and leave a seat or so between most people. Um, there are a couple of us who are a little close, so we might all just shuffle momentarily. Um, Thank you, Bruce, and a couple other people. Um, so please uh, remember that. Hopefully you all checked into this facility using checking Canberra as you walk through the doors. If not in the break, please do so. Um, and finally, because we are both here physically and uh, online, we're using slido.com, um, which is S-L-I-D-O.com, um, to access and ask lots of questions during the symposium. So for those in the room today, we'll be able to ask questions using a microphone. For those online, please go to slido.com. Uh, when you go there, the once again, you have to learn how to spell symposium. The event code is hash DHR symposium, and it'll take you straight in. Um, there's a little quick poll in there if you want to make sure you've logged in and ask you're watching online or face to face. Um, I'll imagine if you're not here, you're watching online, so you probably don't really need to do it. Um, but it gives you an idea of how it works. Um, the Minister for Health, uh, Rachel Stephen-Smith, was to be here this afternoon to welcome us all. Unfortunately, the joys of timetabling and cabinet meetings. Um, she's unfortunately debating some very important matters for health this afternoon, so can't be here in person. Um, however, thankfully, she recorded a, a quick message for us, which I think is probably a great way to start the afternoon. So I'll hand you over to the Minister for Health online or on the screen. Hello, I'm Rachel Stephen-Smith, I'm the ACT Minister for Health and I'm really pleased to be officially, if remotely, opening the ACT Digital Health Records Symposium today. I want to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land that we're meeting on and pay respects to Elders past, present and emerging. I acknowledge the ongoing contribution to the culture and life of our city and region of the Ngunnawal people and all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Canberrans. The digital health record is one of the biggest investments that we're making in health across the ACT and is designed to support our larger goal of delivering exceptional care to Canberrans when and where they need it. The digital health record will be implemented right across our public hospitals, our walk-in centres and our community health centres, right across the ACT government public health system. It's all about delivering patient-centred care, as well as making life easier for clinicians, 
for our hardworking healthcare workers. It's about having all of the information you need to support your patients and their carers and families in the one place, at the one time, easily accessible. For patients and carers, it's about ensuring that they can access the information they need directly, all in the one place. Our $114 million partnership with Epic to deliver the digital health record is a big investment in the future of healthcare in the ACT. We're really pleased to be partnering with a company that has global reach and experience in implementing digital health record systems to improve patient outcomes and deliver patient-centred care. We're also really pleased to be engaging so many people in this process. We have more than 300 clinicians and administrators, experts participating right through the process to ensure that the digital health record we deliver here in the Territory is what we need for our citizens, for our clinicians, for our consumers. Thank you very much for your participation in the symposium today. I hope that you learn more about what we're doing and most of all, I hope that you participate, become enthusiastic and continue to support the implementation of the digital health record here in the ACT. Thanks and have a good day. I'd almost like to say thank you, Minister, which seems a bit strange when she's not here in person. Um, and look, I think probably that the, the comment there about it's very much about our healthcare consumers is probably key to everything we're doing, the digital health record. Um, and in that vein, I'd like to introduce uh, Dean Hewson. Many of you will know Dean already in the room. He's the Vice President of Healthcare Consumers Association. Um, he's a health consumer, a very passionate advocate for designing uh, more digitally enabled health systems um, with people at their heart. Um, Dean's the Vice President of the Healthcare Consumers Associ uh, ACT Executive Committee. Uh, and is also a consumer representative on ACT Health's Digital Patient Flow Program Board. Um, and Dean has been involved in everything from the development of our digital health strategy through a range of uh, systems over the last few years. So without further ado, Dean, can I ask you to come and address everyone? Thanks, Peter, uh, and thanks to ACT Health for inviting me today to say a few words. Um, thank you to the Minister and Wally again. Thank you for uh, that stirring acknowledgement of country. Uh, and Peter, apologies too for needing to duck out during your speech. The, uh, the day job calls uh, quite often. Um, so I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we meet too. Uh, I pay my respects to the Elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are part of today's event. Now, one truth that many hold dear is that change is the only constant. I'm only 34 and I think this was the beer garden when I was studying here. Um, now settled back in with my wife and kids like a salmon returning upstream, I'm very grateful for some of the changes I've seen as Canberra's health system has continued to evolve. Some things don't change though. No matter how digitally enabled a health system is, at its heart will always be people. People, the time we share, the care and support we give each other, the relationships we forge, and the communities we build and are built up by. So what could change, what should change about our healthcare in a Canberra with a health system underpinned by something like the digital health record? What makes a digital health record more than just a computerised version of the paper-based or digital yet disconnected records most of us are familiar with? Some might say it's the patterns, the trends that can be found in and between comprehensive and connected data sets. The ability to see where each of us sit you know, in a bigger picture, the chance to see more clearly the contributing factors and similarities between our health challenges and those faced by others. Others might say it's the time and effort saved in having to look around for information or having to tell the same story to a new clinician less frequently. The more savvy among us might even point out, oh, absolutely fine. Um, I was much the same. Um, the more savvy among us might even point out that it's about making a synchronous relationship asynchronous from being able to consider the health decisions in front of us not just in the middle of an appointment but later that night or a week later or over a coffee with a trusted confidant in our more quiet moments with more time and space to think. And none of them would be wrong. These are truly worthy advances that a digital health record should support. But the crux of it, the beating heart at the centre of what we must help a digital health record to enable is the fundamental deep shift it can drive in the relationships between the people who need healthcare and the people who provide it. With an effective digital health record, professionals and consumers who have engaged in developing the processes and mindsets needed to use it, we can change the way we relate to each other. From one-to-one -one care to a team, from a consumer to a partner. 
from a patient in crisis acting like a hub in a wheel carrying test results and x-rays from one part of the health system to another, at times carrying the greatest burden when we're at our most vulnerable and we have the least capacity to carry things, to that information being available to those who need it and those who want to see it whenever suits. I've heard a lot about digital health empowering consumers and some about it empowering clinicians too, but I believe its biggest strength is in how we can empower the relationship, the partnership, if we're brave enough to keep walking down this road and make improvements hand in hand. The only way to reach the connected, accessible, safe and high quality digital health future we want is to take part in building it. I'm sure you'll hear more from Peter on this as I know he views this as not just an IT project so much as a fundamental way, change to the way that healthcare is delivered. The system we have today is a result of a lot of blood, sweat and tears and it is fundamentally a, a pretty good one with of course room for improvement. When making change, it's important not to fall into the trap of make, failing to make improvements by holding a digital health system to a perfect future state rather than comparing it to what we currently have. When it comes to something as complex, vital and personal as healthcare, we have a responsibility to be more than just good, however. We have to figure out how to be great. But we can't always know how to be great from day one. There are many challenges on this road that we'll have to face together. Access to care, improving the rates of digital inclusion and the, and the digital and health literacy needed to engage with the digital health system, careful consideration of privacy balanced against the significant benefits of information being available, effectively monitoring and evaluating, evaluating the quality and safety of the changing system to ensure the best outcomes for consumers as we automate or otherwise digitally augment parts of the system. Now there are two core challenges that I hope we can keep in mind as we continue along our digital health journey. Number one, how do we enable people more agency and flexibility to make decisions in their healthcare while also maintaining the right guardrails and the ability to take a doctor's knows best approach when it's wanted or needed? And number two, how do we address the biases inherent to the digital algorithms and human perceptions based on data to improve our decision making and ensure the system continues to become more equitable, more just and deliver consistently better outcomes? Not I nor anyone else has all the answers to these hard questions. We'll only figure them out together, over time, working hand in hand. So what I want you to take away with you as we embark on this next step in our digital health systems journey is together is this. We all care. We all have roles to play in achieving the best possible health outcomes. A digital health record focused on consumer outcomes and experience is certainly fundamental to this. A shift in how we provide and receive healthcare is possible. And it's a shift I think we all want. And it's a shift that a digital health record should help enable. But that shift won't be able to be completely defined before we start, only as we go. So let's make sure we go together. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Dean. Uh, we'll be doing Q&A for people as we go through the day. Um, however, Dean's also joining us later, so I might call on him a bit later. Um, which gives him an excuse to uh, duck off for other things. Um, quick, I suppose, I'll give you a quick overview of what it is we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, and look, as has been said, whilst I work in IT, this is not an IT project. This is purely a clinical transformation activity. It is not about IT and widgets and things that plug together. It's about how do we provide a tool that helps our clinical colleagues across the ACT public health system provide exceptional care to all of us. Every time we go there to the hospital or the health system or our family or our friends or people we haven't yet met. So it's important. These are the key things we need to focus on. So why are we doing this? It's all part of the digital health strategy, which is looking at very much we have a plan. We have a whole roadmap mapped out of how we can actually use technology to enable clinicians to provide exceptional care. If you want, you can have a read of it today. I can give you a five minute summary anytime you like. It's available online and many of you in the room or online were actually involved in developing this digital health strategy with us. And fundamentally, the most important single thing about it, enabling exemplary person-centered care through digital innovation. That's the entire reason for this. That's why technology is involved in healthcare. That's why we're doing all of these things. It's not because I get excited by widgets, I don't. It's because it actually helps people provide better health outcomes. So the digital health record um, very much is all around focusing on what actually matters for patients and consumers and clinicians. You can look at it from a, I don't know, a Tolkien way, one system to rule them all. 
Fundamentally, the idea is it's one single system that gives clinicians at their fingertips the information they need to help provide better care for the patients that they have in front of them. And that's one single system, whether they work at QE2 or Calvary or Canberra Hospital, or University of Canberra Hospital, or in a community health centre, or in Justice Health site, or anywhere else across, in fact, even South East New South Wales, as some of the services reach right into New South Wales. One single system about each and every one of us. And it's a system that's actually intelligent and smart and actually helps them do their jobs. And that's what it is. Currently, we have over 254 ICT systems in ACT public health system that I know about, and I'm sure there's a whole lot of other ones I've never yet come across. And that's kind of crazy when you think at times we can expect a nurse on a, a shift to actually access up to 20 or 30 different systems in a day to do their job. And the digital health record is a very big part of transforming that. And there's a huge range of other things that will go with it in terms of a technology perspective, but also in terms of how it will actually change the way care is provided. So, We've chosen a system. Sooner or later, if you're going to roll out something like this, you actually have to choose one. We chose Epic. Fundamentally, many of you were involved in this. This was a decision that was made around what mattered and what would help us improve the ACT public health system. And so we look at it. Epic really are working with us. They are our partner. And it sounds kind of silly. Um, and most of you know I don't do cutesy stuff particularly well. What I find vaguely disturbing, but also really speaks volumes towards their mentality, is every time a new customer joins the Epic family, um, they actually play uh, a wedding march across the, their main campus in Wisconsin. Um, so clearly I've drunk the Kool-Aid and I'm there. <laughs> but I think it really is, it is a fundamentally different approach than that we have with any other software vendor we've ever worked with. And it really is around coming along that journey with us. And that really is an important key thing for us. It's a 10-year contract with an option for an additional 10 years. This will take us a couple of years to put in. In fact, we're going live next year, which already seems like tomorrow. But we're there for the long haul. This is not something we're going to put in, go, nah, you know what, we didn't like that, and pull it out in three years' time. This is a long-term commitment from all of us across the sector. Um, and it really is focused around what will deliver best for our patients. Thankfully, we're not the only ones who are going down this path. Um, and we'll talk a bit more about Epic as we go through. But fundamentally, they're now becoming one of the biggest vendors of such software in the world. And increasingly, coming across Australia. So there's a whole range of things that we can do here. What actually matters is it's focused around patients, it's focused around clinicians, and it's focused on being integrated. So you don't do one thing in isolation. Everything flows together in the same way that the healthcare provided to our consumers is all integrated. And the system mimics that. We went through a fairly robust procurement process. Um, those of you who have been involved in government procurement know what an exciting thing it is. Um, I get just thrilled the idea of having to read 10,000 pages in a couple of weeks. Um, we chose Epic for a whole range of reasons, and it was a very hotly contested procurement. But the number one reason we chose it was based on the view of the tender evaluation team, which I might note was also majority clinicians. And based on all the feedback that came through the various town hall sessions we wrote, we ran, the feedback that was provided through those sessions, the voting that occurred through that process from all those clinical colleagues and administrative staff across the system, that this was the system that would best enable them to provide exemplary care. It's as simple as that. This isn't about going for the cheapest solution we can find or the one with the shiniest toy or whatever else. We chose Epic fundamentally because it actually will help each and every one of you transform the care that's provided across the ACT. And that's the real reason we went with Epic. It's as simple as that. There's a whole lot of people involved in this, and the team is somewhat large. Um, we have over 300 subject matter experts um, who are working with us. We also have 130, 140 people in the Digital Health Record program team. And now I get to embarrass them all, and we'll see if they remember their chairs flip up and down. Um, <laughs> key people who are leading it, um, Rebecca Healand, our Chief Nursing and Midwifery Information Officer. Um, Associate Professor Essex. Uh, Rowan's our Chief Medical Information Officer. Um, Sandra Cook, Executive Branch Manager of Future Capability and the two people who actually try to dodge me almost every single day, who do the nuts and bolts. Uh, Philippa Kirkpatrick, who's leading the implementation side, and Christina Carroll, who's leading the technical side. Christina gets to do all the stuff that's fundamentally boring to us, but without that, like a network and devices and integration, it kind of wouldn't work. What's important to note is out of this, if you look at everyone up there, there's only two people up there who don't have a background as either 
clinicians or scientists or are still actively practicing. There's only two of us that don't. And this is a clinically led program, and that's really important to remember. This is a clinical transformation of activity across the public health system. It's not an IT project. If it's an IT project, I can put it in three months later, move on, waste a whole lot of money and achieve nothing. And that's why we have clinicians leading these various elements, and that's why we have the subject matter expert process we have. We also have a whole range of other people in the team. We have over 30 nurses who have now joined us, and that's a really exciting thing. We have three doctors on the program. I'd love to have 30, but once again, I can't afford it. Um, 26 allied health professionals. Now, it's not quite one allied health professional for every profession we have in the ACT, but we're getting close, and I'll keep working on getting more on board. We have nine staff who are experts in various support services in hospital administration areas. We have more than 350 subject matter experts and over 60 working groups. Let me be really clear. This is your system. This is your transformation project. I'm simply here to provide the administrative process to make it actually happen to enable you to do that. The governance process is also set up. So we have the program board, which is overarching across the top of it. Two thirds of the members are clinicians. And that really gives you a view of how we're focusing this, how we're structuring it. There are over 60 groups then that form, sit underneath this and it goes across processes inside CHS, inside Calvary, across the territory through all the working groups and committees. But at its heart, it's clinical. And the subject matter experts, I need to thank you ahead of time. Um, I need to remind you not to hate me um, when we get into this because we will be very, very, very um, imposing on your time at certain times. Other times I'll leave you alone for weeks on end. But every single minute you put into this program will actually help us make sure that it meets your needs and that it improves the care that you're able to offer. So thank you very much. You'll be an amazing resource as we go live. I expect almost each and every one of you will be constantly emailing me saying, Peter, this is a really dumb idea. Why did you do that? Um, at which point, that's where I get to try and unpick something stupid I've done. Um, but really, you are the heart and the soul of the project and you'll be guiding us every step of the way. And that really matters. So, you've almost heard enough from me. I'll get off the stage in a moment. Um, 100 direction setting sessions. We're kicking off. This is happening. We go live in September next year. That's literally almost, it feels like the blink of an eye. So, get involved. There's a whole process. There's mailing lists. There's all sorts of engagement. You get to come along, kick the tyres, try this offer and go, yep, I love that and I hate those five things. That's the aim of these sessions, to start telling us where you want it to go, how you want it to work, and so forth. So your engagement there is critical. Yes, it will be an impost on your time, but the return you'll see many, many, many times over. Um, and it really is critical to ensuring we meet your needs. So I said we're going live in September 2022, and we are, and that's terrifyingly close. What it means is by the middle of next, beginning of this year, we've started, we've onboarded. Um, as of tomorrow, the project team go through doing all their online certification and their training and their exams, and I wish them luck, the pass marks are quite high, 80% um, for some of them. Um, so it will keep you, the project team members, busy. We start building the system middle of this year, and we have a year to build it. The middle of next year, we need to be pretty much locked down. We're getting ready to go live. So we'll have a few months to get ready for this, and then we've got a 12-month sprint and it's going to be a sprint for 12 whole long months. Thankfully, there's nothing else happening that's distracting us, whether it's COVID-19 or critical services building and so forth at Canberra Hospital, but we'll be at a 12 month sprint. But at the end of it, we will train over 10,000 people across the ACT public health system, and we will go live in September and we're doing a big bang approach. And it's really important to recognise what I mean by a big bang approach. We are going to rip and replace on day one over 35 systems. And these are systems that most people use every single day in their job. They will all be removed. Those 30, 35 systems are responsible for only 90% of the data processing we do across the health system. So it's a smaller number than the 250 I quoted before, but they're all the key ones. And that includes the patient administration system. That includes everything that mostly happens on a ward. That includes pathology, where we're putting in beaker, that also includes medical imaging, where we're replacing ITIS with Radiant, which is the EPIC module for medical imaging. So this is a whole transformation of our healthcare system. 
and a whole new technology platform, but it's exciting. So that's enough from me. Um, you actually came today to hear from people that actually know what they're doing and have done it before. And we're very much designed today to be focused around what will you as clinicians actually see? What will you gain from this? What will you be able to do that you couldn't do previously? And what will your patients benefit from? Uh, and so we structured the program very much today to hear from people who have been there and done it before us, and actually to learn from some of the things that went well for them and some of the things they thought, perhaps on second thoughts, I'd do it a different way. So first of all then, on that basis, I'd like to introduce to you Professor Keith McNeil. Um, Keith is the Acting Deputy Director General, Chief Medical Officer Prevention Division and Chief Clinical Information Officer for Queensland Health. That wasn't enough of a mouthful. He's got many other appointments outside that. Uh, and one of those for his sins is the independent chair of the Digital Health Record Program Board. So Keith actually joins us every month to share his wisdom and expertise and to keep me on the straight and narrow. Um, Keith has little experience in rolling out any of these systems. I mean, it talks about a couple of things here, something about being a chief clinical information officer and head of IT for all of NHS in England, um, chief executive officer at Cambridge University Hospital's NHS Foundation Trust when he went live with Epic. He's heavily involved in the CERNA implementations in Queensland and has been involved in this scale across the globe. Um, so without further talk about Keith, and I've got to make sure he can fit up on the stage. Um, Keith, thank you once again for agreeing to be our program board chairman. Thank you for listening to all of what I've said. And most importantly, let's kick off. Well, uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Peter. And it's a, a real honour to, to be able to fulfil this role. And I'm really looking forward to the next uh, 18 months or so as we go on this, this journey. Uh, so one of the things that you're probably sitting back there now is thinking, well, you know, it's going to be kind of interesting, isn't it? So these programs are interesting, they're challenging, they're exciting and they're tough and there are moments of anguish and, and angst. Uh, and why do we do it? So I'm going to try and give you some, well, I'm going to try, I'm going to give you some perspective as to why we're going down this, this road. So um, I'm going to start by saying, well, you know, the answer is digital, but what question are we answering when we, when we look at this? Uh, and really, it's, it's how we move to the use of information. How do we move from all the data that we're collecting right across the system to turn it into information that we can use to make really good decisions? That's pretty simple, really. Um, now, our digital journey started way back here in 1897 when uh, JJ Thompson discovered the electron, the first fundamental particle of physics, which is the reason that we have digital technology. And this plaque that you see here sits on the wall of the Cavendish Laboratory in Cambridge. Uh, and you can go and stand under it and take pictures of it like I've done with all my kids. And it's really an inspiring sight. Uh, JJ Thompson won the Nobel Prize for Physics in 1906 for showing that the electron was a particle. And in the bizarre world of quantum physics, his son, 35 years later, won the Nobel Prize of Physics for showing that the electron was a wave. And they were both right. Um, <laughs> Now, uh, now, Matthew, I see Matthew up the back there. Just down about 100 metres from this plaque is the Eagle Pub, and on the wall of the Eagle Pub is the uh, discovery of DNA by Watson and Crick, where they announced it to their students. So it's a really quite a heady atmosphere. If you go across the country a little way to a, another place called Oxford, um, this young chap here, Tim Berners-Lee, when he was uh, working there and then went to work at CERN, he invented uh, or discovered uh, or developed the, inter the World Wide Web, not the internet, the World Wide Web, um, uh, uh, something that was described by his supervisor at the time as vague but exciting. <laughs> Um, now, now, you might ask, well, why did Tim go to all this trouble to build the World Wide Web? And it's really important, it's really interesting when we think about what we do in health. And if you look at his, um, if you look at his original thesis, and there's that vague but interesting quote, um, just read this. In those days, different information on different computers, different log on to get to it. Sometimes you had to learn different program each computer. Often it was just easy to go and ask people when they were having coffee. Sound familiar? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's like the world we live in today, isn't it, in, in healthcare. So, you know, this was 30-odd 30, 30 years ago, well, pretty much exactly 30 years ago now, uh, and we're still catching up in health, aren't we? And yet our whole life is invaded, pervaded, persuaded by all these digital technologies that we have at our fingertips in every walk of our life. Except, of course, in healthcare, where uh, we still rely on this sort of thing. Yeah. So there are still a lots of places that are just paper-based, and and I think you know, I'm, 
running out the vaccine program, we're still going to be faxing stuff around. Of course, the fax is end-to-end -end encrypted. It's very safe. But of course, when the paper falls off, it's not the most ideal way of exchanging information. <laughs> and we can certainly do better. Now, healthcare has been really successful. So here's, here's one of the great, great story, great news stories about health. So here we are back in just after World War II, uh, when the average life expectancy of a male in Australia, in the UK and the US was about 63, 64 years old. So, you know, I'd, I'd have 50% chance of being dead if, I'd, if I was in that, that, uh, that era. Sobering, isn't it? Whereas now it's over 80 for, for males, 84 for males, I think 86 for females. And what a wonderful story that is. But of course, we all recognise increasingly that as our population ages, when they get to that last year or two of life, uh, that they start to, to consume or deserve, is a much better word, much more in terms of resources and healthcare. And, and we're all struggling as to how we're going to cope with that. And I can tell you that the only game in town in terms of how we as a society and, and, and we as a healthcare organisations are going to cope is with the digital uh, agenda. And of course, when you add into that the, the sort of lifestyle diseases of the 21st century, you start to bring that demand back uh, into even, even younger age groups. And when you add the ageing population, the chronic comorbid diseases, the impact on the health system is phenomenal. And we really need high quality information to know how best to deal with these people, how to set up systems and how to treat them all, both on an individual and population basis. Now, when you don't understand the healthcare system, you put together nightmares like this, which is the, the NHS. Uh, and um, I say this deliberately, this is a King's Fund diagram. And when you look at what's happened there is that, and, and we see this playing out now with how they've responded or not responded to COVID, the reason is that they don't understand the system there and they don't have the right information to make decisions. And if you look at all of that, that's where clinical services are delivered. The rest of it is an overhead of reporting and bureaucracy that's just absolutely um, killing them, uh, both figuratively and literally at the current time. It's really quite sad. But that has come about because there's no information there to tell people how to set this system up more effectively. Now, um, when you look at, uh, at those systems, we work in a really complex, chaotic system. If you model it mathematically, um, this is what we've got. We've got a chaotic system. And I want to give you an example of, oh, this is interesting. Anyway, I'll give you an example here of um, ventricular fibrillation. Uh, now, work that we did in Cambridge, where of course we, we went, went with EPIC and we were able to consume lots of data. We worked with uh, Caltech University. Um, when you look at that tracing of ventricular fibrillation, you see what looks like a random series of electrical discharges across the heart. When you examine those electrical vectors on very sophisticated machinery, um, and you'll be able to do this, and, and Afsal Chowdhury will tell you about some of this later on today, um, through the EPIC platform, when you examine the electrical vectors there, you can, you can take it down to the granularity of one one hundredth of a microsecond, right? Think about one one hundredth of a microsecond. And when you do that and you look at the patterns, you can see, you can actually start to model that. So you can start to model what we thought was chaos. You start to understand what was really a complex, chaotic uh, sort of situation. What's even more exciting is that if you look at the tracing before, which to our eyes would look normal, you can start to see perturbations in those electrical vectors, uh, which predict the onset of that. And so you start to see, like they've done on the ICU in Cambridge, you can start to examine these things and pick up when someone might be going into ventricular fibrillation and intervene before they get there. So we're predicting and preventing rather than waiting for them to break and fix, as I'll come a bit later. We've seen that one already. Now let me give you a couple of examples of why information works so well when it's used properly. So NASA, really great organisation. Um, well, Something happened to the slide there. So a really great organisation that in 1961 put uh, their first man into space, Alan Shepard. Of course, that was four years, four years after the, the Russians had gone up there and they were getting, they were getting their butts kicked. Uh, and John F. Kennedy said in 1961, well, it's great to put a man into space, but you know, by the end of this decade, we are going to put a man on the moon. And they did. Now, how did they do that? 
they recreated themselves as an organisation into an information sharing organisation that embraced complex adaptive systems and they got information out to every level of the organisation and they started to talk horizontally in networks. Engineers talking to astronauts, talking to designers, talk, et cetera, et cetera. And they put a man on the moon. Unfortunately, they didn't learn their lessons because then they started to chase financial goals and they went back into hierarchies. Uh, and the Challenger blew up in 1986, which was a real, which was a real uh, tragedy. Um, but th they started to not. And if you look at the Challenger, uh, history of Challenger, you'll find that the information about that was known for six months before it just didn't get to the place where it needed to get to in terms of making a decision about those O-rings. So information in the 21st century is absolutely critical for dealing with complexity. Something's happening to these slides here. Anyway, I'll keep going. Um, so it's, it's really information because what information does is it brings order to chaos. It enables us to understand complexity and the more information we have, the more we can understand it. And that's really important in clinical medicine. Uh, and what, we, what we're about with these systems is our ability to democratise data, to get data to all, all parts of the organisation. Which brings us to our digital health agenda and why it's so important. Now we've got lots of data in health. Everywhere's got data, but it looks like this. So it's all over the place. It's all different. It's, uh, and you go and try and find anything in there, it's, it's, a, it's a nightmare. It's really difficult. And we're putting systems in that try to help us make sense out of data. Because data's like crude oil. It's very valuable. But unless you, unless you actually refine it, i.e. analyse it, you can't get any real value out of it. Another blank slide. And another one. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> oh. Okay, well, we'll we go on to reimagining. Um, <laughs> So, so what we're setting out here is we're setting out to change the way we think about the data that we generate and, and how we can make it work for us more, uh, work for us more effectively. And this term reimagine you'll hear, we, we're going to reimagine healthcare. And it comes from a guy called Eric Brynolfsson, and I'll talk about him if the slide comes up uh, in the not too far distant future. But that, that term you'll hear, reimagine healthcare. Oh, that's a challenge. And um, what we're moving to are, are these systems here, learning and knowledge-based organisations. Now, pay particular attention to this is because all the data that we have in health is generated by the interaction between a clinician and a patient. So fundamentally, healthcare, ever since the beginning of time really, has been about a clinician sitting down with a patient, exchanging information, asking questions and getting answers. Uh, and then we record that information and we see patterns in it. So the first person who turned up with crushing central chest pain going to their jaw and down to their arm, nobody knew they were having a heart attack. But as we saw it more and more and we were able to record it and share it, the patterns emerged. And we know that that's typical of a myocardial infarct. Uh, and so that, that clinician-patient interaction is absolutely critical. Uh, and all of the data from there is what we capture in a digital health record. And we capture it to the, in a granular to the nth degree. We aggregate it and we analyse it and we turn it into information and knowledge. And then we share that information and knowledge. Looks collected once and then used multiple times. Clinical intelligence that feeds back to inform that interaction. Business, public health, knowledge and research. All coming back to make that interaction more effectively. Now, that interaction is critical, and one of the slides that didn't show up, um, which is a shame because it's the, the key slide of this whole, whole presentation, really, is, is a picture I've got of a patient who's dying of a Stevens-Johnson reaction from having been given penicillin when they had a known penicillin reaction. Now, in the NHS, on average, eight times a year, someone with a known penicillin allergy turns up at an NHS hospital and is given penicillin and dies of that reaction. That's been like that for 20, 30 years. Every single year, on average, eight people a year that happens to. Now, nobody got out of bed in the morning to deliberately give someone penicillin who's got a penicillin allergy, to either prescribe it or dispense it. The reason that that happens is because at that point of decision making of prescription or, or dispensing, the person who did that didn't have the right information at their fingertips at the time of making that decision. So from the day one when you turn this system on, 
and we saw this in Cambridge, that will never happen unless someone does something deliberately. The system is there to stop that sort of thing from ever happening again. And so this is, in effect, the biggest investment in safety and quality we ever make for our patients. It just transforms from day dot the way we can, we can provide safety and quality to our patients. And as you add in the opportunities, when you have these digital platforms, you start to be able to embrace the world of precision medicine through machine learning, artificial intelligence, through embracing genomics or all the other omics, by being able to collect data in novel ways uh, and being able to, of course, bring information to that, to that interaction so effectively. And of course, precision medicine is how we are really going to change the dial on how we deal with people individually at a population level and embed sustainability in healthcare. So these are, this is the Brynjolfsson uh, paradox, paradigm that I was telling you about. It's called the productivity paradox. Uh, and there are two keys to this. So every digital system in the world, when you, when you launch them, it doesn't matter what business you're in, uh, you don't get instant returns in terms of productivity. It takes you a while and you've got to go through a cycle. The first thing is improve the technology. So you're investing, you know, 100 million or so dollars in improving technology and that's exactly what you need to do. Then you need to reimagine the work that you do so that it makes maximum use of the technology. And then what you find is you go through this cycle three to five times, reimagine the work, that then provokes the technology to improve. The technology improves, you reimagine the work and you do that three to five times, which is about a year a cycle. So you find that in three to five years, you've embedded, you've improved, you've optimised and you take off. And that's the sort of time frame you need to be thinking about in that. And Eric Brynolfsson was an engineering professor at MIT. Another oh, blank slide, geez, it's tough. Okay, so what does that mean on the ground? Well, this is a simple paradigm that I put in when I was in the NHS, doing the NHS job. Uh, the digital transformation was about five things. Empowering people, consumers and patients to get involved in their digital journey, really important. Supporting clinicians to provide really great care. You know, go figure, you, you make clinicians' life easier, you give them the right information to make really good decisions and the patients benefit. Integrate services more effectively, no better way of doing that than by flowing information across traditional silos. Manage the system effectively, that business intelligence that we get out of there so that we know how to manage the business. And create these platforms for the future, all based on these models, uh, all based on these foundations of, of citizen identity, uh, cyber security, information governance, etc., etc. Uh, three horizons that you go through here, and these are shown in series, but in fact they are in parallel. You create the horizon one, which is get the, get the technology right so that you can collect the information, then extract information from that and start to use that to inform care, uh, and then move into the, into the future uh, with all of the ability that you have with these uh, data platforms. Um, this is kind of like where we are now, so does anybody know what that is? Yeah, no, no, it's not, a, it's not a prescription I wrote, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I, my secretary gave me a card once with something like that and it said, a wise doctor once wrote. <laughs> um, uh, anyway, that's, that's actually a scribble that Frank Geary did uh, when he was conceiving the uh, Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao. He, wrote, he did it on the back of a napkin as he was sitting having coffee. Uh, and it's sort of like an idea. We've got an idea and a concept of what we want to be like uh, and we've got to form it. And where we're moving is to the finished article, which is spectacular if you've ever seen it. Um, and, and it is about our ability to move from data to decision making. So I hope this build works, otherwise I'm in trouble here. So, we start down here with, with this descriptive, maybe not. So we start down here with this descriptive diagnostic paradigm, which is a rear view mirror of the world. We can tell exactly what's happened. We can even diagnose why it's happened, but it's already happened, so we're always playing catch up. And this is the broke fix analogy that we're in. People turn up, they're broken, and then we fix them. We want to move up here into this, which is predict, prevent, uh, where we know what's going to happen and we can actually do something before it does. So that analogy with the ventricular fibrillation uh, that I showed you, we can tell when it's going to happen, we can stop it happening. And that's what we're moving with these platforms. You will move from data, simply collecting data, to actually being able to make really, really high quality decisions 
every single time anybody across the organisation wants to make a decision, they'll have the right information in front of them to make a really highly effective decision at that point in time. And that's probably all I've got to say. And that's how you transform healthcare. So, you know, welcome to the journey. It's going to be fun. Thank you. So before Keith, before Keith escapes too far, um, we might have time for a question or two. So if there's anyone in the audience who has a question, put your hand up and we'll bring a microphone to you. Otherwise, if you're online, please do it through Slido. Um, and whilst people are getting their questions typed and getting ready to answer and I'm trying to stare down the bright lights, um, Keith, what's the number one thing that you've seen that sort of for patient safety that sticks in your mind that you've seen this type of journey deliver? What's the one big thing that you think about every time? Um, first, uh, first 18 months uh, after we went go live in Cambridge, the system flagged up 8,500 allergy and drug potential issues uh, from a prescription. And we calculated that if 8,500 that caused a change in the prescription. So it flagged up an allergy or an interaction or a whatever. Uh, and um, that wasn't even with pharmacogenomics in the mix. Uh, and if you calculate 10% of those being clinically meaningful, that would have caused significant morbidity. It saved 3,500 acute bed days uh, just in that time. That's from the day we flicked the switch. Wow. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And no pressure at all. I'm sure Afsel will tell you that. Later. I'm sure he will. OK, Ryan, got the first one over here. Just across to Dr Coatesworth over there. We're going to make you run as far as the other side. Oh, Grace, if you can... Thanks very much, Keith. I just noticed on one of those slides there was... Uh, of those pillars that you introduced, there was one of the um, tabs that said clinician um, performance management. And I'm just wondering, how did the doctors and nurses in, in Cambridge embrace uh, the <laughs> tool as, as sort of part of um, I thought performance management? Why don't we just say um, accountability? Uh, and, and did you um, foresee any uh, challenges with that? And what were some of the learnings? Yeah, no, it's a really good question because, of course, Performance and accountability now is, is, is us, as, or is me, me as a CEO from when I was there, producing some report and handing it to them and say, Ex please explain kind of scenario. What, what, what we're able to do when you get this data out to people is, is people do that every day as part of their business, as part of their continuous improvement cycles. So they're continuously looking at their own performance and benchmarking within uh, you know, across systems, across nation, etc., uh, and doing it, doing it on a, as a business as usual activity. So you don't actually have to have a, have a performance team sitting across doing it, generating it. People can actually do it for themselves, uh, and that that they really embraced. Uh, and, and, but and again, it takes a little while to get into there. But uh, one of the things we did in Cambridge was we embedded data anal analysts in all of the business teams, in all of the clinical teams. Uh, not small ones, but all the divisions, so that they would have access to that data day to day and they could uh, improve their performance iteratively without me having to jump up and down on. Wonderful. Thanks, Keith. So we've got a couple of online questions for you. How is your British experience different to the Queensland health experience you have had? Um, look, in many ways it's very similar. So Queensland Health uh, um, uh, uh, has gone with... Uh, a single instance of an electronic record happens to be Cerner, uh, which is enabling us to, to provide a population-based platform, so far covering 50% of our adult care and 85% of our children's health care, so giving us a fantastic opportunity. Um, that was a, an aspiration in the UK when I was there, when we were conceiving something called the Industrial Life Sciences Program, which was to produce these data platforms across populations of three to five million. Queensland's population is about five million. That, by the way, was supposed to be the post-Brexit economic recovery tool, which generated, um, was going to double biotech income from 60 to 120 billion pounds a year. Uh, Cambridge contributed 15 billion pounds a year to that 60 billion straight up, and it was all about information and sharing with the partners on the campus. So we're trying to do that in Queensland, um, and they're still trying to do it in the UK, but I think the, 
the the, the experience, so the experience is same aspirations, um, wholly different, uh, wholly different setup in terms of the the way the system's governed and run, which it would take me ages to go through. So, <laughs> um, but so, same aspirations, and everybody's on the same kind of journey for one reason or another. Exactly. And look, we might pick up on that English experience for one last question. Um, the NHS has um, nice guidelines which can be incorporated into the system. However, that's not the case here. How can we build a safe system in Australia? Well, generate the data for a start and then get people to analyse it so that you can look for variation. Uh, I mean, th there, are, there are any number of guidelines out there. Uh, Australian Sa Commission for Safety and, and Quality, that's uh, a really good start. Um, every hospital will have them, but it is about building your data sets and then getting them out there so people can use them. Mm -hmm. It's not about the patient and safety and quality unit having all the data or the, or the uh, accountants want. It's getting it out to the clinicians, the people who work on the front line. That's, that's, the real, that's where the real system resilience gets built and our ability to be able to sustain really good healthcare. Wonderful. Look, everyone, can you join me in thanking Keith for his presentation? Um, the good news is Keith is uh, hanging around for a bit longer, so we can harass him if you're here face to face in the break. If not, I'm sure you can find him online. Um, speaking of online, our next speaker is Adrian Hutchison. Uh, Adrian's the Chief Nursing Information Officer at the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne. Um, Adrian, for those who haven't met him before, has a very strong clinical background in paediatric emergency intensive care uh, and was heavily involved in the core project team that implemented um, EPIC as an EMR at Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne in 2016. Since then, he's been involved in the successful transition of the Royal Children's Hospital's instance of EPIC across the whole Parkville precinct in Melbourne. Um, and the joy of COVID, Adrian's not allowed to leave Melbourne. Um, Something about Canberra being full of COVID, no, just joking. Um, so look, I'll get out of the way uh, and let Adrian take over from there. Hello, everybody. Can everyone hear me? Yes. yes. Great, and you can see my screen okay? Yes. Yes, okay, great. It's, uh, it's uh, absolutely lovely to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation to talk. And I, I do apologise for not being able to be present um, for this, what, what's to be a very exciting time for Canberra. Um, I have been uh, chatting with a, uh, a lot of your colleagues uh, from Canberra, uh, all through the uh, RCH and the Parkville um, implementation. And uh, I'm really excited that um, a, you've been able to take on EPIC as a vendor to uh, implement and um, also uh, where needed, we're more than happy to provide assistance to ensure that you do a better job than what we believe we did. Um, so thanks thanks for listening. Uh, hopefully these will go across. Okay, so just for those you don't know, um, Royal Children's Hospital. Now, I'll give a bit of a perspective of the Children's Hospital, but a lot of what I say will be um, relative also to the Parkville Precinct. Um, for those of the, you that don't know, we've just implemented um, across the Parkville Precinct at the Children's, the uh, Royal Melbourne, the Women's and Peter McCallum Hospital. And what we've done there is shared an instance of or the RCH instance of EPIC, and um, we've rolled it out across the four hospitals and that um, went live in um, uh, August last year. Uh, some of the data that I'll share is based on the children's hospital experience. We haven't really been live long enough across the precinct to uh, share their information. And again, that will be up to them to share it uh, once it, once it comes forward. So the Children's Hospital is a, a biggish hospital, uh, 340 beds. We've since increased to um, 65 hospital in the home uh, beds. Have about 48 to 50,000 inpatient episodes a day. We have up to 85,000 emergency department presentations, operations around 20,000 a year, and lots and lots of ambulatory attendances. Many, many staff. Um, and we needed to transition our paper-based hospital onto an electronic system. Now, this will be very familiar to all of you, and I heard Keith talking about medication errors, and um, when you see the medication uh, chart just below in the middle, uh, and also the operation notes there, is it any wonder that we continue to have errors? Um, the nursing workspace above was um, where medications were administered, 
in amongst all of the paper charts that were required. Uh, now, when we went live in 2016, prior to this, this is Michael Marks, a paediatrician, and um, the interesting thing about this picture was that um, the uh, his arm is resting on a single patient history, a very chronic patient of ours, and um, uh, we needed to do something from an electronic point of view so that this wasn't an ongoing issue. So you can appreciate the, um, the difficulties in transitioning from a largely paper-based system, uh, and really we couldn't possibly go back to working in this way. It's almost an unacceptable way of working these days, and. Um, I look forward to many, many other hospitals being able to transition to an electronic record. Sorry, the, uh, oh no, there we go. So um, really the principal reasons for implementing an electronic record, and I have no doubt that these will be very similar to the ones that you have chosen. Uh, we wanted to improve clinical care. We wanted to make sure that patients were safe. And I heard Keith talking about some issues that, um, well, in fact, many, many hospitals experience with uh, medication errors and uh, we need to try and eliminate these. We also want to uh, ensure that patients and family were engaged uh, more. Um, we wanted to increase our throughput. Uh, we wanted to make sure we were an efficient hospital. Uh, we wanted to be able to support research. But we also have to be accountable for our financial performance. So um, all of these things, all of the research that we had done ensured that um, our financial performance would improve. Some of the guiding principles that we put together, now uh, the little triangle down there you see on the right hand side of the screen is really uh, the triangle of care that we, uh, we believe in and practice at the children's. We wanted to have excellent clinical outcomes. We want um, healthcare to be a positive experience, timely access, zero harm, and it's got to be sustainable. Um, so in implementing our electronic record, uh, we also wanted to make sure that we had evidence-based uh, practice so that we could deliver the safest possible care. Um, evidence shows that uh, standardising practice also um, uh, is safer for patients. And um, we all know that there's much variation and duplications across hospital and having the EMR platform uh, gives us the ability to reduce that. The system had to be easy to use and certainly had to drive efficiency and reduce waste in the hospital and certainly uh, supporting clinical effectiveness and research as I've mentioned previously. Um, so April 30th, uh, 2016, uh, RCH went with a big bang implementation. In August 2020, Parkville uh, had a COVID implementation where they went from paper to EPIC. And um, the big difference there was that they uh, were in the middle of a pandemic. And there was a period of time where we didn't really believe that we could uh, deliver the product. A lot of the back end work was done, but the logistics of implementing an EMR in the middle of a pandemic was uh, very confronting and um, uh, but was achieved successfully with um, no, uh, no issues regarding transmission of infection. So we're hoping that the Canberra implementation looks a bit like this, where you transition from paper, yours is the immunisation implementation and many of the benefits that EPIC have in terms of uh, 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 infection control practices, uh, they've got a module that you're getting, I think, called Bugsy. All of those things are going to be highly relevant to uh, the way in which you'll roll out EPIC in, in, in the coming months and years. Just a little bit on what we implemented and what were our success factors. This is pretty well a standard implementation approach where we um, you'll be uh, in the discovery and education phase, I suspect. Um, I, as I know that you've started to employ people and um, a lot of legs are hitting the, the ground now. And um, this is really preparing the hospital for how you might approach an EMR implementation. Now, this is relatively standard methodology for uh, project rollout for an EMR um, with a, a few minor variations. But um, certainly these phases that we went through were 
very sound in their uh, in their logic. They were evidence based and um, can certainly say that um, with the help of Epic, we stuck to these uh, religious. Um, project governance. This is probably the most important aspect to the project, where um, uh, you set up your governance structures uh, to, to ensure that what you say you will do, you will do, and that people within the hospital will follow through on the things that need to be done for implementation of an EMR. This is a absolute um, transformation of the way in which you work. Um, the way you currently practice will be completely different um, the day you turn on your EMR. But there's a lot of preparation to make sure that you are all on the same page, um, that you're all working towards a common goal, and that you can also sustain the effort involved to maintain an electronic system to ensure that it delivers all of those requirements that you first set out to do. So governance, and I know um, Peter O'Halloran and, uh, and colleagues have um, set up a good governance structure. Uh, they have been visit, down to visit us a few times and hopefully we've been able to pass on some tips that will be helpful for your implementation. Again, um, the, the, um, all of the different committees within the hospital need to be um, buy into the process of the governance. So we have many, uh, many uh, great care committees, as we call them on governance, consumerism, uh, medication safety, et cetera. All of those need to buy into the new way in which you will now work when you implement the EMR. And everybody needs to change uh, the, the, the methodology of what they do so that they can feed back into the electronic record and ensure that you get the benefits that you're looking for, both um, patient safety benefits and certainly financial benefits. So some of the success factors uh, we realised from um, our project and also from the Parkville project more recently is that we were adamant that it was not an IT project. Of course, it is an IT system, but it's got to be implemented for the right reasons. And uh, changing the way in which we work from a clinical perspective is the most important reason why we do this. Um, some of the success factors of our team were that um, many of our analysts were clinicians, um, uh, which was very helpful in terms of analyst training to understand the EPIC system, and now we can go in and change that system through our governance structures, but we have an understanding of what is required for the, uh, the lowest common denominator that will use the system. Um, we did need to externally recruit um, uh, others from outside the organisation, which I know you have done, uh, to fill some of the skill gaps. The, we had a very big emphasis on training, which was mandatory, and that was supported by a CEO. Um, and it's interesting, the, uh, we were able to reduce our training requirement pre-EMR from around about eight to 12 hours, and now we have a two hour online session where required. So um, once there's a body of knowledge within the organisation, training becomes very simple, uh, and we're happy to share our experiences with that as well. Um, we had very strong support from our vendor, um, uh, both on-site and off-site. Um, they have a support model from Verona. Now, in the COVID world, that's going to make it a little bit more challenging, but I think certainly the, I think of one only two hospitals that went live during the pandemic, um, we were able to prove that um, remote support um, can be done and it can certainly deliver a successful implementation. Um, we're hoping that that's not the way that you have to go, but um, be reassured any anxiety that you have around um, around that, uh, it can certainly be accommodated by the vendor and also your project team. Um, we've spoken about governance. Um, interesting, the uh, very important uh, when we first went down the EMR line was to make sure that we uh, engage with all of the medical, nursing and allied health and um, also non-clinical roles to ensure that they understood the implications of the electronic record. Uh, what it would bring to them and also what they wanted it to bring to them so that we could build it in. Um, 
benefits tracking, again, everyone in this day and age needs to be able to pay for their system. So we had uh, very robust benefits tracking, uh, both on staff satisfaction, and we've just uh, just completing another survey on staff satisfaction. Need to make sure that we can pay for this in an ongoing fashion and, uh, and that it's um, good value for money. Uh, make sure that we stuck to budget, um, which we certainly did, came in on budget and on time. Um, that we uh, become more efficient as a hospital, which is one of the guiding principles of what we want to do for the first, in the first instance, and ensure that um, uh, quality and safety standards improve as well. Just in terms of staff satisfaction, and again, this is from a children's hospital perspective, and this was relatively early on, but we're able to show um, uh, that as we move, the further we moved away from go live, the more satisfied staff became. That had a lot to do with on-floor support, the training that they received, and also the support that we received from Epic to respond to any issues that might arise um, along the way. And that staff satisfaction um, continues. We've had a reduction in the numbers that have participated um, uh, in the recent survey, but certainly we're expecting uh, very similar experiences. Um, operational benefits, and certainly um, in the in the uh, eight quarters uh, before and after uh, Epic EMR implementation, um, we had an increase in um, uh, admissions of 8.2%. That's for many many uh, reasons, but um, uh, certainly we were able to increase capacity with, through the efficiency of the electronic record. Our patients, we saw a 21% increase in uh, our patient attendances, um, again, all through the efficiencies of the electronic record. Um, ED wait times, interestingly, um, despite having increased numbers, we were able to improve our ED efficiency by around about 21%, um, where the wait times went down in our ED. Um, so other things that improved were wait list uh, management um, uh, reduced significantly. Again, this isn't in COVID times. We haven't looked at the results from that as yet, but um, certainly in a, in a normal environment, uh, the uh, waiting times for your list should, should reduce. Telehealth had a significant growth. Um, now this is pre-COVID, uh, so just through the implementation of the EMR gave clinicians the ability to increase their use of telehealth. Um, it will be very interesting to see, in fact, we're probably 80, 80 to 90 per cent of telehealth uh, visits currently, uh, or certainly post, um, post uh, the acute phase of um, uh, the lockdown. So the clinical benefits that we received, and uh, we've all seen evidence of this, is that we have a single system where all of the information is in one place. It gives us a clear overview of the patient where I can look on my mobile phone or my tablet and I can see all of the relevant information that I need to see from the patients that I'm caring for. And that goes from a uh, nursing perspective, allied health perspective, and also a medical perspective. Um, things are easy to find. Once you're used to the system, it's very easy to find the information that you need. And Epic over the years continues to improve the um, interfaces. They continue to improve the, um, uh, the, the, the user interfaces so that things become more easy to find. The system is extremely fast. Um, we very rarely have performance issues. We had some performance issues in our transition over to the Parkville precinct where we went on to a common network, but um, those issues were identified quickly by the technical team and we're back up to very high performance um, uh, access to our EMR, both on mobile devices and also desktop and network devices. Um, you want to aim for 100% uptime. We have had very few um, unscheduled downtimes, had some very early in the piece. Um, uh, another one um, uh, late last year, um, but this minimally impacts and people are so well drilled at um, a downtime. People don't panic, they get on and they document on paper for the short period of time. And then information is then back entered into the EMR. So it has virtually no um, impact. 
on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, and certainly we haven't been down for more than a, um, 10 hours, I think might have been the most time that we were down. Um, and they were due to hardware failures rather than uh, issues with the database. Um, you can have multiple concurrent users, so uh, capacity is not an issue. You know, you can be confident that the technical team and the project team will ensure that the number of concurrent users are licensed appropriately and so that you can all get the information that you need. And certainly things like device integration has been a, a significant boon for um, people in critical care areas, operating theatres where the, the, uh, the, the task of entering data on the half hour or the hour just no, no, no longer needs to exist. All the information is pulled directly from the patient monitoring or ventilation and is pulled straight back into EPIC um, and available for recall at any time. And as I mentioned, um, we all have uh, the ability to have remote access. It's been um, very helpful during the COVID lockdown where many clinicians chose to do telehealth appointments, uh, work remotely, uh, and many, many staff from the children's also work remotely. Um, interestingly, from a um, patient safety point of view, the efficiency of um, the, the way in which uh, start patients were monitored within the EMR, where we have what we call the Victor charts or the MET notification. Um, given the visibility of the um, observation charts, we had an increase in the number of MET calls, uh, which is exactly what you would want. You want to be able to see that patients are deteriorating. And into the future, we'll be looking at integrating alarm systems into the EMR so that we can push notifications to the patients of when a particular patient is deteriorating. Um, the, now again, we don't attribute all of this to uh, the EMR. Many things have happened uh, that may contribute to a uh, reduction in mortality, but certainly we noticed in the quarters pre-EMR and post-EMR that we had a 22% reduction in um, standardised mortality rate. Um, so just wrapping up a little bit here, just from the Canberra experience and from my understanding of what you will be implementing in Canberra, certainly with your uh, patient administration system that you're implementing, uh, Grand Central, this will significantly reduce the number of uh, interface issues that you may have had or that we have previously had. And we look very much with interest on how the PAS is implemented because uh, at some point in time we would like to uh, utilise the PAS as well um, from EPIC. Once you have everything integrated under the, under the one system, it makes EPIC uh, flow seamlessly. Same can be said from Beaker, uh, which is the integrated laboratory system, and that's heavily dependent upon the patient administration system to reduce interface errors and uh, ensure notifications and um, laboratory results get to the right person at the right time. Um, this will be a huge advantage for Canberra. And uh, again, we look forward to you implementing Beaker um, and also the PAS. Um, as I mentioned, the information will be pushed to you just as it is us, but you'll have hopefully a more seamless experience. Secure Chat has been, um, we turned Secure Chat on um, late last year and uh, we um, have had uh, a significant transition away from paging whereby uh, staff can communicate uh, within the context of the EMR and within patient context that allows you to um, discuss a patient within uh, within secure chat. You can uh, uh, and, and nominate anyone that you would like to discuss it with. Um, so we see a lot of uh, scope for um, secure chat within the EMR that you will also benefit from. I understand uh, also that you have spectral link devices up in Canberra and uh, we, I'm currently project managing the spectral link devices uh, down in Melbourne. They've been a huge boon for mobility within um, within the children's and certainly across the Melbourne and also the women's hospital, uh, whereby nursing staff can uh, do their uh, medication scanning. They can identify patients. They have all of the things that they need to um, uh, do most of their clinical work. 
and with many of the functions that EPIC are bringing out, such as the nursing hub on, um, on the Rover application, uh, we see um, mobility as the way of the future for all healthcare professionals. Um, so what can you learn from our experience? Um, first off, uh, be reassured it's been done many, many times before and uh, it's been done successfully. Um, where it hasn't worked successfully, it's usually because the recipe hasn't been followed. Um, but um, you can certainly be reassured that the vendor um, pretty well does everything that they say they will do and they assure delivery of that project. Just be mindful in the early stages that this is the first day um, or this is the, the start of your journey for EMR. It's not the end of the journey. And um, trying to perfect the system in the early stages uh, means that you may lose sight and try and overreach for the things that you're trying to achieve. Your, the obligation of the project team is to deliver a system whereby it is safer for patient care, it is more efficient, and you can do your work. Um, it is unrealistic to think that any project team can deliver the perfect system um, up front. Um, and the perfect system evolves over time uh, if we ever get there. But it's a, it's a journey that you go on with your EMR team as well as uh, the vendor that's supporting you. Um, this will absolutely unify um, all of your hospitals that you're uh, planning to implement um, with a common goal. Um, the camaraderie that exists across uh, the Parkville precinct that with hospitals that you know, knew each other existed but rarely spoke. We have um, very good relations with all of our um, Parkville precinct hospitals. We have a very robust and um, uh, good decision-making clinical council that ensures that the clinical decisions that are required for the EMR are made at a consultative level across all four hospitals. Um, and um, that is uh, that is one thing that will uh, ensure the success and ongoing collaboration be, be between all health services. Um, you're in the very uh, early phases, so you need to develop a, a philosophy of build. How do you want it to be for you in five and 10 years time? Uh, and then work towards that. Four years ago, when we implemented, nearly five years ago, um, we had a build philosophy that was um, had to be simple for the users, um, probably less focus on mobility at that time, but certainly I see the way of the future, uh, particularly uh, with pandemic impacting on people and um, the increase in hospital in the home services, we have a big push now for mobility to ensure that people can travel lightly and still do all of the work that they need to and still be in touch with the hospital uh, with, for, with the people that they need to. Um, you do need to follow the national standards and uh, they're a very good blueprint for the way in which we should be practicing. Um, and standardisation certainly helps um, uh, all of us come together uh, in, uh, in a common fashion to ensure safety of patients. Um, probably the one biggest thing, and I, I mentioned earlier that you can certainly trust your vendor and you can certainly trust your project team. Change management of the staff that you're um, that you're working with or in charge of uh, can be a difficult thing. We had a pretty simple philosophy uh, in terms of trying to handle people um, that may have been a bit resistant to change. And we, we said that there, there were four pillars of um, why we were implementing the electronic record. One was of patient safety, of which it's very difficult to argue that people don't want things to be more safe for patients. Um, Everyone pretty well agreed that national standards were what we practice by. We're also governed by legislation. Um, everyone felt that standardisation was a good thing. And certainly having an evidence-based uh, uh, way of managing patients, um, and certainly at the Children's Hospital, we were blessed with having very good clinical practice guidelines, and we were able to embed them into the EMR. 
Now, from a change management perspective, when people are resistant to change, once you put those arguments to them, then it's very difficult to argue against not putting in an electronic record, other than, um, uh, and really the things that you need to do are to ensure that you support people in the transition to an electronic world. Um, so the lessons learned from both the Children's Hospital project, the, um, the Parkville project, I was over at Great Ormond Street a couple of years ago for their project, and all of them have a very uh, common theme. Um, it's got to be framed as a clinical project, even though there are large elements of uh, IT that is required. That is to support the infrastructure, but it's got to be sold to all of your staff as a clinical project. You're doing it for the safety of the patients and the efficiency of people and the way in which they work. Um, you need to send that clear message to all clinicians and they will help you drive that, um, that project. Um, you've got to ensure that um, clinicians are engaged uh, and that you continue to reinforce the message for all clinicians based on those principles that I just mentioned previously. And make sure that your clinical council um, takes ownership of the direction of the way in which the electronic record should function. Um, Again, we had an independent um, review by Ernst and Young uh, from the Children's. I don't think that's happened as yet at um, Parkville. And um, some of the success factors that were shared um, by Ernst and Young during their audit was that it was a highly uh, engaged and visible executive sponsorship. So look to your leaders for directing you through the um, through the myriad of change that you're about to go under. Ensure that your clinical leaders um, have consistent and active uh, engagement across all sectors of the hospital. Um, the users must want the system from the beginning and I, I have no doubt from the, my interactions with Peter and his team that um, you know Canberra is well and ready for uh, a new way of working, what is probably the only acceptable way of working in a healthcare setting. Uh, I know that you've set up right for the project by all the work that has gone in. Um, you have a methodology that has worked both in Australia. Uh, there's been much Australianisation that's happened um, and it's also worked overseas very successfully. I know that you've got the project director and the managers. Um, the commitment and goodwill of the team. Uh, that we have already shared some of the um, staff members that were on our project team, and I know that um, you know there, there is no greater feeling than participating in a project of this size um, to deliver such a great outcome for so many people. And um, I know all of them will share that same enthusiasm um, with you. Again, we've mentioned that committed to the outcome uh, with a vendor. Um, and I know that you've all planned uh, relentlessly for uh, the way in which you'll uh, function. So hopefully I've covered all of the things that I needed to and I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, look, thanks for that, Adrian, and certainly uh, I can attest that the team at Parkville, particularly Adrian and those of the Royal Children's, have been incredibly generous with their time. I think we've been down a few times now and asked questions and gone backwards and forwards on all sorts of things, and it's amazing to see what's occurred there. A um, couple of quick questions that are coming in. Um, Adrian, would you agree that to avoid medication errors, we must trust, integrate and share public and private and consumer data that exists in disparate systems? Um, in principle, yes, I do agree with that. I think um, getting that to happen long term, I mean, the, the EPIC system is, um, will be an ecosystem for your hospital, um, but it's a receptacle for uh, interfacing all of the external systems to ensure that that can happen. So I have no doubt that over time, of all of the EMR vendors that we've seen and looked at, EPIC has the capacity and the will to have um, connected healthcare, uh, and certainly the technical um, uh, the technical challenges of interfacing with some of these other feeder systems. Um, certainly, EPIC and the technical team will be able to overcome. Uh, interestingly, during the RCH implementation, the the most difficulty we had implementing things with 
was with uh, the My Health record, but that was done uh, successfully and uh, is being utilised at this stage. So I, I would definitely reinforce what you said about um, bringing as much data as possible into um, into Epic as we can. Mindful that um, uh, hospital systems are statewide systems or territory-wide systems, and uh, I know a few overseas hospitals have, um, or overseas countries such as Finland, and um, uh, have looked to uh, implementing um, Epic uh, on a broader base across uh, across the states. Interoperability is um, able to be done, uh, but sometimes it's not always in the interests of the vendor to do it. So that's something that um, uh, we need to work on. Wonderful. I've got a question from the, the audience here. Nick Coatesworth, over to you. Is that working? Yeah. I'm not being the annoying guy that hogs the mic. Not um, yet, anyway. I, not yet. <laughs> I got a text from our CEO, Bernadette McDonald. Um, Adrian, thank you very much for that presentation. Um, would you mind just expanding? You gave some um, very clear metrics there on met and mortality. Um, what other things have you noticed in terms of um, patient outcomes, safety, and also um, patient experience? Have you had anything in the latter that Epic's help you, helped you um, identify? Yeah. Uh, the last bit first on patient experience. Um, interesting, um, the the uptake of the RCH portal or the um, uh, my RCH portal, as it's called, um, is a is a means by which um, patients can interact with their own health record. Uh, I I can't recall the exact numbers uh, off the top of my head now, but I do know that for our chronic um, complex care patients, we have a significant uptake of them using the RCH portal. So um, the platform for EPIC to do, um, to provide information to families and patients is uh, unsurpassed really. It, it has all of the functionality. We haven't even turned on half of the functionality uh, that is possible in the portal. So it's certainly of benefit to um, uh, patients and their family uh, and in our cohort of patients, particularly the complex care patients, um, it, it's been very beneficial. In terms of um, patient safety, um, the, 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 the things that we've noticed, and again, you know, we're not, we're not saying that the EMR is solely responsible for uh, the improvement in um, uh, deteriorating patient. I think it's now, I think it provides us with a platform to give people an awareness that they can easily look and review at what's going on with patients, whether that be in terms of the uh, acute deterioration or whether it be in terms of us being able to review and audit what went on with a patient where there may have been an adverse event. It's giving us much more visibility of what went on. It's giving us timestamps of what went on. Um, so it enables us to review patient instances, and we're not saying that they're all going to go away, but certainly in terms of sentinel, event, sentinel events, um, we've had a reduction in those. Um, and we've also had a greater awareness of staff that I, as the nurse looking after a patient, can um, either communicate via, via secure chat to get the doctor that I need quickly or to ring them up on their, on their uh, mobile device. I can, the, the clinician can directly look at what's going on with the patient. Um, and the other, the other important thing is that the MET modification uh, uh, or the, sorry, the Victor charts that we have, whereby we have the ability to set a threshold for what would be normal for a patient or a particular patient. And that may vary whether you've got congenital heart disease or you might have a respiratory illness. Um, our ability to finally tune that or really personalise that care for that patient gives us the ability to um, be alerted when that particular patient, regardless of what their condition is, uh, may deteriorate. So there's the, the, again, the EMR gives us the awareness that we can easily look to see what's going on with the patient. Um, 
the decision support, and I, I remember from Keith's uh, presentation earlier about allergies, that you know, very rarely that we would have um, any uh, uh, allergy uh, issues, um, you know, because the alert comes up all the time. So there's many, many things that contribute to the improvement in patient safety. It's not all just the EMR, but it's certainly an awareness now that people have the information at hand that the EMR will support the decisions that you make or support the indecisions that you make. I think all of those contribute to uh, an improvement in um, uh, patient deterioration. And, and, and sorry to go on with it, but it, I think there's many other things that we can uh, use EPIC for and certainly push notifications of a deteriorating patient, which is possible. Haven't done it as yet, but um, we're looking to do that in, uh, in the next 12 to 18 months. So lots of things um, that are going to improve um, the deteriorating patient's outcomes. <coughs> Wonderful. Look, thank you for that, Adrian, and thank you for taking the time to talk to us this afternoon. Okay, well, welcome back. It's good, glad to see. I think it looks like almost everyone who was here before has come back. Importantly, for those of us who are here in the auditorium, um, the next break involves food and drink, so please hang around for that. Um, first of all, um, we've got uh, another three speakers um, coming up, and then we've got a, a panel Q&A session where you get to sort of throw questions to the panel members and ask all the awkward questions that you've been thinking about. Um, this is the time, if you've got a question where you want to ask it, but you're not quite sure if it's appropriate to ask, ask. Um, odds are, if you're thinking it, then somebody else is also doing the same. So save up a lot of those questions for the panel members at the end and put us on the spot. Ask people what you really want to know. And if you're cynical like me, feel free to, to express your concerns and so we can assure you how we're going to go forward. So without further ado, um, can I introduce to you uh, Kath Feely. Kath is the Chief Allied Health Information Officer for the Connecting Care Project in Parkville, which was their uh, project equivalent to the DHR. Uh, and she's recently led the Allied Health teams through the design, build and implementation of EPIC EMR across Parkville. Um, Kath, for her sins, started as work as a physio uh, and in 2013 started getting involved in digital health projects and has been involved in electronic patient journey boards, reporting and EMM, EMR implementation, both CERNA and EPIC. So without further ado, Kath, over to you. Thanks very much. Uh, it's very exciting to be in Canberra. I haven't been here for many years and I've really enjoyed um, what a great city it is and especially beautiful being so green. So thanks for having all that rain. <laughs> okay, so um, as we know, my name's Kath and I'm the Chief Allied Health Information Officer um, on the Parkville Precinct. That was a project role and now that's actually ongoing. So it's a permanent position within the precinct, which is really exciting for Allied Health. Yeah. Oh yes, I need to press the button. Whoa, whoa, let me go back. Okay, so today I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about my first go at EMR implementation, some of the learnings that I had, what I could take across to my second go or take two EMR implementation. Hopefully I did do a better job the second time than we did the first time. And also I just thought I'd give, share with you just one small evaluation that we did where Adrian was talking about how we decreased waste by making a very simple, a, sim a couple of simple adjustments in the EMR to make sure that um, we weren't wasting clinicians' time and we weren't increasing burden, which is really what we don't want to do. This was actually us go live day. Um, everyone else started at 3 a.m. or whatever the time is that you start. But of course, Allied Health aren't usually in the hospital, thank goodness, then. Um, so we started, this was our Saturday morning. This is the ICU team heading off to the ward. Um, green super user, um, right in the front. This was one of our credentialed trainers and we were excited to get going. So first of all, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about implementation that I did at Western Health. And I'll just let you read quickly about Western Health. So this was a CERNA implementation, and we really did inpatients only. It was very successful across the five sites. During the process, one of the things that we thought about is a problem that we had, which was around we were receiving, we were, we were receiving electronic referrals at the time through IPM, 
And one of the teams, which is the Aspire team, which is sort of a quality team that, ha that we have in Allied Health there, um, decided that there was really an issue with the referrals that we were receiving. Um, we were missing information. You didn't get the clinical information that you needed for allied health inpatients. And so therefore trying to prioritise where do I need to go, where do I need to start my day was really difficult. And what that did, it is actually impacted the time that allied health clinicians can spend with their patients. So you'll notice they were actually having to spend about 17 minutes to prioritise a single referral. Self-audit, maybe they wanted something to happen, so maybe they upped the numbers a little bit, but it's a significant amount of time. And that was from 800 referrals. You can imagine the waste that goes into that is quite significant. So what we really ask the question, and this is the type of thing that you're going to be doing over the next while, while you're um, planning and building, how can we make it quick for the referrer, but how can we also make it useful for the allied health person who's receiving the information? What are the type of things that we can think about? So we had some people get together and think about what are the, what are the key things we need to know? Now you'll know if you've worked with allied health before, each area has a crazy matrix of prioritisation. Some areas might have priority one, two, three. Someone else, the speech therapist team, I hate to say, had something like 14 priorities. And so that is not going to work. How can we teach someone else to get out this crazy matrix and make a decision? How do I make this a quick referral? So instead, what we did was we had four options that were clinically relevant. And I'll show you them when we get to the next slide. We also had some defined reasons of referral, so no one actually had to type anything. It was very quick. So in two clicks, pretty much, you could sum up everything that we needed to know once the referral came to the other end. In Cerna, you can, um, auto can, you can sort of set up some auto-generated referrals. In Epic, they don't do that, uh, but more, it sits within the best practice, practice advisories. Um, and I must say, we had spent a lot of time trying to stop those auto-generated referrals coming through incorrectly. And so we did embed referrals within order sets. So what you'll see is five months after Go Live, we had 25,000 referrals that we could look at for us to make some decisions about whether this was working. And it was, it was quick data out, few pivot tables, and then we have the information that we need to be able to make decisions moving forwards. So you'll see, which is really difficult to read because it's sort of missing off the bottom of the screen there, but we had four, when I talk about the clinical priorities, we just had four, simple. We had the patient was at risk of clinical deterioration. The second one, that discharge was waiting, was pending and allied health review. So as soon as an allied health clinician sees that, well, there's my P1s for the day already. Discharge greater than 72 hours, discharge within the next 72 hours. And that was the first decision that a clinician on the ward who was referring had to make. And you'll see we, what we were slightly concerned about, and this is something that we can check over time through the process, is that everyone would just choose the first selection because I want to make it really quick. And particularly in that circumstance, it was a drop down list. I'm going to choose the first one. So what we wanted to do was make sure by looking at the information, are people choosing the first one or is actually this working like we had planned it to? And so you'll see we had about 15% of the referrals out of around 20,000 referrals where clinical deterioration, it was about 15% of the referrals. Seems pretty reasonable. So we think this is actually working. So it was one thing to put it into the system, but then it was another thing to actually check back and say, is this working like we thought it would be? And you'll see for a particular team, for example, spiritual care, they had about 65% of their referrals, which was the patient was at risk at clini of clinical deterioration. And that's when we would want the spiritual care team to be there. And again, that meant, right, we, we know where to start our day. And so just to give you a quick example of, from a social work perspective, these were the reasons for referrals they used. Again, really simple, but gave quick decisions to the clinicians. So if a referral came through where it was suspected um, a child at risk, elder abuse or family violence, again, that was their call, I know where I need to start my day. So this is just an example of one way that you can actually develop and build your system and design it to work well and to reduce the waste. So I have to say, it's not the EMR team. We weren't the ones that did this evaluation. So it wasn't us saying to everyone, write down how good we are. 
What it was, was clinicians re-evaluating with the Aspire unit, and then luckily that data was available, we used it later. So what you'll notice was an, a significant decrease in the amount of time for one task, one thing that we can do using electronic medical record, significant decrease of time and decrease in waste. From that first uh, implementation that I was involved with, we did have a number of learnings that I'd just like to share with you and then I took on to the next project. One thing that is allied health staff were particularly positive about the change on the whole, which was really great. And as we've already heard today, communication was really one of the key factors. So it's communicating early, it's communicating regularly, and it's building very strong connections with the teams that you're working with. What I think we needed to do better after the first, uh, after the first implementation was actually have some, we did develop standardised um, allied health workflows, but there was probably only a few of us in the room that made the decision, and we decided for better governance, actually, we needed to change that. And we needed to think about a framework again for standardisation, because there's such a wide variety of allied health professionals, but we'd like to have some commonality in how they were thinking about they were going to design and use the EMR. And I can't, I can't stress enough how important your super users will be at the end of this process when you're actually going live. And so early thinking about who's really keen and who's eager within my teams. I'm gonna say this more than once. Do not overdo specific data entry fields because people really hate them and they don't fill them in. And at the start in particular, it's really hard for them to see, to change and think, why, why am I doing this? This is just a really difficult process. Be prepared for curveballs. When you're on the project, you never know what's coming next. And um, as I'll say, in the future, we had a huge curveball in implementation, implementation number two. But in implementation number one, you never know what's happening. And so I often think, what am I needing to deal with for the next 15 minutes? And then I can worry about outside of that, after that 15 minutes with what's next. <laughs> and I think um, from this particular implementation, one of the challenges was we were just adding an additional system because we were only looking at inpatients into an already, as we were hearing before, there might already be 130 systems in the system that the people are having to use. So after that first project, um, it is quite full on. You'll find at the end of this time that it's been a challenging time that you're working through. And I was looking forward to doing six months in business as usual, and then I was going to take a year and go traveling. Yeah, unfortunately, a few of those things didn't work out. But first, uh, there was a great opportunity for me with the Chief Allied Health Information Officer at Parkville. And so I said to my partner, I'm really sorry, like I know we're going travelling, but uh, I'd like to do this job. Then I had to come home and say, I'm really sorry, I got the job. <laughs> so moving forward, I was actually really excited to move to implementation number two. And I was super excited to see what EPIC had to offer and how it was different. Because if anyone's done worked where you've done one implementation, there's always whispers about what the other vendor is like and then whispers going back and forth. And it's interesting when I've done both, everyone sort of whispers the same thing both ways. <laughs> anyway, so I was really excited about it. Now, Adrian gave you some of the details about the children's hospital. From the adult hospitals, we had a lot of staff. We have a lot of beds. And I was looking after about 800 allied health professionals from around 17 professions. And we did have our go live in August 2020, which was scary and exciting. And we did do big bang implementation. So it's high risk, high reward. I'm not going to really go over this much because Adrian had already touched on it, but as we've heard numerous times, clinical transformation, not an IT project, led by clinicians for clinicians. And Adrian's already gone through most of these points. What I did do early on was realised that, yes, I had some change management experience and I'd had a bit of experience with EMR, but the great thing about I found working with EPIC is how amenable everyone else who is using EPIC, they're just open to you coming and asking questions. 
For us, we were really lucky that we had the Royal Children's Hospital with the experience just down the road. And when I mean just down the road, it's about 10 minutes max on a slow day in the sun to walk from the Parkville Precinct down to the Children's. And we could not have done what we did without their help. And we were, we were happy to receive their assistance. And I would, val I, would, I would anticipate that you will also be looking for any assistance that can come along. So that meant we had some children's clinicians coming and giving overviews. This is how we're using EPIC. This is why we really like it. These are the great things that we've done so far. And also from an allied health perspective, Greater Ormond Street was really helpful um, because in the US, the way that allied health work can be quite different to Australia and the UK. And they'd gone live about one year ahead. So it was a really great timing for them to give us information. EPIC's network is amazing. And if you ever get the chance to go to UGM, it's amazing and crazy. There's a lot of people. There's a lot of information. But I've put two asterisks because there's not much information yet coming from allied health perspective. And it's certainly something that we would like to see in the future is more information coming out um, with um, research in this allied health clinical informatics space. And we did also visit MD Anderson while we were over there. So thinking about this clinical transformation, not for an IT project, what did we do? So as you've all established, we've got your subject matter experts from every profession. We had that within Allied Health. And it was really thinking about who's key. So it may not be the manager, but it may be a senior clinician, someone who's actually working on the floor, understanding our current workflows. They were great. Uh, we made sure as much as possible that allied health were included with any shared workflows, so multidisciplinary decisions. So is it around case conferencing? Is it around managing wounds? Uh, where you've got a number of professions all working together. And just to let you know, our allied health super user ratio was 1 to 10 that we used at the precinct. From a standardisation perspective, we actually established an, LM, uh, an LMS. No, we didn't. We established an EMR. Allied Health Advisory Group. So we were the R AG. <laughs> Terrible. Everything gets <laughs> cut down. But um, they didn't have that when they went live at the children's. And I think that we had representation from all of the organisations, including the children's, within this group. We had allied health directors, we had managers, and we had clinicians. And every decision that was impacting allied health came up through that group. And so that was our level of governance. If we had a decision that we couldn't come to, so all four health services had to say yes. If we didn't have a decision, sorry, if we couldn't come to a decision, then we had clinical counsel as our next level of governance to then assist with making a decision. But luckily, mostly Allied Health um, worked together really well and I didn't have to take many things through to clinical counsel, which was great, but would have been more than happy to do it if we needed to. We also got together an allied health core group and nursing did the same um, in the Parkville project where they talked about what are all the commonality, what are we all doing the same and how is the best way for us to do it the same. And within those, we actually brought someone from the children's in to give us extra advice. So we had someone who had done, done it before and we were saying, oh, it might be amazing to do this. And they would say, actually, we tried that and it really wasn't successful or great, we didn't even know that that was possible. And so in the end, what we, de what we designed was things like um, an allied health navigator. So when someone comes into inpatients, everything that you needed to do was there in one space for you to work in. And interestingly, the children have decided to actually adopt. So some of that now is going back even between the two projects, uh, sorry, the, the two sort of with the children's and the Parkville project. And then what we did after we had made a lot of these core content decisions, they all went back to advisory group for sign off. And then we had some summits with our super users fairly early on. So we were starting to disseminate the decisions around why are we doing things this way? Why did we choose this level of standardization in this way? And then from an allied health reporting and research capability point of view, where we started is really about allied, we have some um, live reports around what is the demand for allied health today in the hospital? How many patients have we got who are awaiting allied health intervention for discharge? How many patients have we got at risk of clinical deterioration? Where do we need to send our staff immediately? 
so that we've got some decisions that we can make then and there, can sit with managers, senior clinicians, wherever. And we also have got some longitudinal data that we can look at. So I just wanted to show you this timeline. So this timeline is the number of daily cases of COVID in Victoria. And you'll see on here also our different time points. When we postponed in late March, we never anticipated that we would be going live at the peak of COVID within Victoria. But we did, and it was successful. And I think one of the main things was the, dri the drive from clinicians for us to be able to access information quickly, access information from home if required, spend, not spend as much time on a hot ward if I could do some of my pre and post um, documentation and reading off the ward. So even though it was scary, we managed to do it and it was successful. Oh, sorry, they're not supposed to jump out. There's nothing too exciting about those two extra ones. I didn't realise, oh, that's good news. You can't see that slide because it's just a big picture of my head. Yes. <laughs> and uh, yeah, oh, did it come through? Uh, oh yeah, sorry, oh yes. I didn't realise how big the screen would be. Um, but one of the things we did, but because we knew we were going into this COVID environment, we thought it's, staff were challenged, staff were stressed. How are we actually gonna do this communication? Because we know it's so key. So what we in Allied Health decided to do is we focused on our super users and we had a 15 minute catch up every fortnight from May, which then became weekly until go live. So they knew what was happening. We did demos, whatever they needed, we ran through. And then we left it to the super users to decide within their teams, when are they ready to hear this information? So we made sure we kept that communication. We, I'm just gonna move forward because I can't keep <laughs> looking at my own head. Um, we we um, made sure that they knew what was going on and we let them take control of communicating within their teams. And I think that worked really well. We did have a successful go live. We had um, super users in PPE, on wards. We had remote support in America. We had remote support in Parkville. We had an amazing amount of support and we were very lucky that it went extremely well and Mallory would attest to it. It was a great um, implementation. So from the, from the um, clinician's perspective, I've, we have our, we have a um, now post live visit, which was our first post live visits, which happened a couple of months after implementation. And this was the feedback we were getting. It's really easy to access information, documenting notes, communication, using secure chat. The uptake of that has been really great. We were able to connect better with our patients. So the, one of the ways that we are documenting our goals from an allied health perspective, when the patient leaves the hospital, they get what's called an after visit summary. And within that are the goals that we've set with the patient about this is what we wanna to work towards. And they're also, we have this opportunity to make things cross encounter. So when someone comes into ED and they tell us some information, well, we put it into the EMR. And then as they go through the system, we don't need to keep asking that question over again, which is really great. We've started sending out some proms before appointments through the portal so that when patients come to their first assessment, we've actually already got some information that they've completed, which is great. Um, we use the similar information referral management system that I did on the first project. And we also worked with the patient journey board to think about how can we make what we're doing visible to everyone in the organisation. As I said before, we've got some cross encounter information and one of the big things we did was pop in a pre-morbid assessment. So it didn't matter who asked the questions, I didn't need to ask the question again. MDM and group documentation, case conference is all going really well. And we had, as I spoke to before, about that up-to-date inpatient clinical demand reports. Learnings from an allied health perspective, training, there, we ran some very generic allied health training. We did have to somehow, we, we left it to our super users to do, but provide some profession specific. If you want your, um, if you want your teams to be documenting something in particular, then it's important that they're taught how to do it. 
We did a lot of product, so PID is production, so checking that people can log into the system. So when we went live, most people could log into the system. But not everyone was day one ready. So when they logged in, they chose the wrong department to log in. And then they're saying, the screen doesn't look anything like I expect, and because if I log into a different department, it looks different. And also the patient lists that I need. So I think adding to your production check a couple of things about where should I be looking and what should I be looking at on day one is really critical. And we also had some difficulty with in-basket pools and it took us a while to sort that out. There were some um, sort of sections which we would consider MDT care that Allied Health um, weren't quite in the room for. And so for example, tracheostomy management. But it's something that we identified and the great thing about Epic is that you're not stuck even in day three with what you started with at day one. If you need something to be improved, you can work with the team and improve it. And it is a really big change from Allied Health to move from writing all of your notes to try and encourage you to put some data into other fields within the system. And so again, I say, do not overdo data field entry. And over the next 12 months, we're hopefully going to finalise some evaluation that we've done from an allied health perspective. We're going to review how the clinicians are actually using the tools. So are things being used as we had anticipated? What do we need to do? We're going to increase the connection to our patients. So trying to really work with a, um, what we're calling health hub, which is the patient portal. And as Adrian spoke before about how we're going to do easier documentation when we're on the road and with virtual care particularly allied health managers, but also clinicians, we need to think about what reporting do we need to come out? Now we're putting information in. And I really feel once we can provide, cl particularly clinicians with clinical information that they've put into the system, and we can say, here's some outcome measures of your pre and post for this particular patient, then we're gonna have better buy-in with filling in those slightly annoying data fields. And finally, we've spent time pre-go live and we'll continue to upskill allied health in clinical informatics. We spent some time with um, clinicians pre-go live teaching them how to use some of the basic smart tools at a system level. And we're planning to continue that, which was really successful and has been extremely su successful at Children's, particularly from an allied health perspective. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. And I am willing to answer any questions at any point. Thank you. Let it come well, on. I thought, I thought I'd done my time. <laughs> Almost. Look, we might just do one quick sure. question um, and then we'll fire the MC for the day. Yes. Um, <laughs> did you at Parkville in the precinct include community based services, sort of occupational therapy, uh -huh. nursing, physio, et cetera, in, in the system? And how did that work? What mm. was the difference between those services and the sort of more traditional admitted, not admitted, actually on the hospital campuses? Yeah, so we have. Um, we had our, obviously our inpatients. We have quite a large outpatient. We have um, what in Victoria we call hip services, with, which is help, 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 get it right, health information programs. Maybe not. <laughs> I can't remember. Hip programs. But pretty much what it is, it's looking after people in the community. So it's chronic, complex patients in the community under a harp wing. We also have community therapy. So it's possibly patients who've been in subacute or acute, they've gone out to a community and we're supporting them. It's also home care. So that was factored in. Um, when we had our um, you know, get together, let's find out how things are going, we made sure we included clinicians from each of the health services, each of the professions and inpatients and outpatients and community so that we were capturing all that information in one. And as we move forward, we're going to try and continue, rather than little pockets doing something, trying to continue that standardisation. But it's actually been taken up really well in community because they take their laptop, they can read their notes as they go, can come out to the car or do their notes while they're in the, in the community. Excellent. Yeah, thank you. great, thank you. Okay, so Kath is more importantly around afterwards to talk. So in the meantime, thank you again to Kath.
And just to make sure we're all still awake, I'm going to change it up a bit today. So our next speaker now is going to be Dr Afzal Chowdhury. Uh, those of you who might not have met him before, uh, he's a con uh, consultant nephrologist at, and the director of digital and chief clinical information officer at Cambridge University Hospitals Foundation NHS Trust. Um, in his spare time, he also lectures in the Department of Medicine um, at the University of Cambridge and has completed an MA in medical education. Um, I'd like to welcome uh, Dr Chowdhury to the symposium today. Obviously, the joy of uh, COVID, he can't fly here at the moment. Um, we have, however, got him out of bed at some ungodly hour. And I think it's about, about 6 a.m. or something at the moment in Cambridge. So um, thank you very much um, to Dr Chowdhury for joining us. Um, and now we'll see if we can get the gods of technology to put WebEx up on the screen behind me and hopefully we're taken to a not so cold but early morning uh, Cambridge. Morning, everybody. I hope you can hear me and see me. Excellent, thank you. Uh, yes, good morning. So in fact, uh, we, we have had our first little bit of snow yesterday, so um, it is a little bit chilly here, but not too bad. Um, but I'm very pleased to, to be with you, um, and thank you very much for the invitation to, to talk. Um, I'm just going to share my slides with you, so hopefully you should be able to see that any second now. Can you, are you able to see my slides there now? Hello? Yes, we can. We can. Yeah. Yes. Good. Okay, I can't, for whatever reason, suddenly I can't hear you very well. Anyway, I shall press on. <laughs> um, so, um, I just really wanted to give you some background about the work that we've done here in Cambridge um, and also to uh, uh, talk about some of the benefits and the lessons learned. And uh, just by a little bit of way of declaration of interest, so I, I've done some work for um, HIMSS both at, at a UK and at a European level. And the first thing that I really want to say is, is a big thank you to um, Keith McNeil, who I'm sure you will all know far, far better than I more recently. Keith obviously was our Chief Executive at Cambridge, and this is a quote from our, our Government Secretary of State in 2017, uh, not long before Keith was due to return uh, from us to, to yourselves. Um, and I, and the, the, the reason that I want to put this up is um, certainly at a personal level, but I think at an institutional level, we are all eternally grateful to the work that Keith did with us at Addenbrooke. And the, the core of um, of of what you want to be able to do and the core of how you deliver that really does depend on that vision that comes from from the most senior leaders in your institution. So um, this is a picture of our campus. Um, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but um, all of the, the less glamorous buildings at the, the lower end of the picture are the NHS part. The much more shiny buildings and the newer buildings at, towards the top of the picture are uh, the university, the global headquarters of AstraZeneca and, and some other buildings. But nevertheless, the campus is growing. And in fact, this was the driver for the work that we did right at the very beginning when this work started in 2010, when it became apparent to us that at that point, as the campus was going to grow, the, the, for a hospital of our aspiration to continue with a paper-based system was going to be fully inadequate for the care of our patients and the work that we wanted to do going forward. We we do historically, for legacy reasons, have two his, uh, hospitals, um, Addenbrooke's and the Rosie. The Rosie is the maternity hospitals, but in fact, we, we behave as one fully integrated system and the women's and children's uh, department is just one of our five clinical divisions. So a little bit about us, um, uh, 1,200 beds, um, our local population just over half a million, but we serve a regional population of between four and five million people. And we also um, have um, uh, some national services that we provide for very specialist cohorts of patients. And uh, the numbers are on the screen, but between 120 and 130,000 people in the ED day cases, 70,000 inpatients and so on. We have around 11,000 NHS government employed staff, but when you add on university employees and visiting people, that number increases closer to sort of 13 to 14,000. And one of the challenges in the implementation of 
any sort of digital record, which I'll come on to, is at a very basic level, um, do you know who your staff are and do you know what your staff do? And at a very simple level, is everybody who's called a secretary doing the same sort of thing? And if they're not and you don't understand that, then that was going to cause you quite a lot of challenge when you give them all the same sort of security in a digital system. And on the day you switch it on, you suddenly find out that a whole load of people can't do what they were supposed to be doing. And a whole load of people can now do a lot more than they were supposed to be doing. Um, and it, it can be a real challenge. And the same thing applies for all professional groups and grades. So we started back in 2010. Um, <clears throat> our chairman at the time sent a, an immortal email one line, which is what would it take to implement an electronic patient record? And the challenge for us was that we had very few systems that were worth keeping. Many of them were decades old. Our lab system, our patient administration system were 18, 19 years old with no, uh, uh, really just the most limited functionality, <clears throat> no significant support, no audit trail and nothing that was very modern. We started our procurement post processes through 2011, um, went through all of the EU rule processes at that time and got to a preferred bidder status for both software and hardware back in 2011. But it took us another year to go through all of the assurance processes with government regulators and others before we were able to sign any contracts. And we had split our work into um, the software implementation for, for which we chose Epic and then the changes to all of our infrastructure which for which we chose Hewlett-Packard. And this diagram will be something that you guys will be familiar with as you go forward over the next year or so um, where we started from the point of signing all of the work around uh, training our team in order to configure Epic to work for us and doing the clinical validation pathways configuring the system, testing the system, and then for us towards the end of 2014, we trained uh, all of the end users. We trained 12,000 people in nine weeks, uh, initially training six days a week, but by the end of the time we were training seven days a week from six o'clock in the morning till 10 o'clock at night. And um, we went live on the morning of the 26th of October. Um, those of you who are lovers of history, that's the anniversary of the gunfight at the OK Corral. And, and on occasions it did feel a little bit like that. But um, for us as an institution, this was the entire hospital, um, everybody all in one go in the, in the usual epic fashion of that Big Bang deployment. <clears throat> and so on the first day at Go Live, in essence, every single epic module that was available to us um, in, in, in the UK was what we implemented um, across the entire estate as I've described. And then over time in 2016 and 2017, um, perhaps a little bit later than we would have liked, we implemented initially the MyChart patient portal and then the welcome checking kiosks. In 2018, we implemented um, linking with other hospitals through Care Everywhere and the primary care Epi portal EpiCare Link. And then in 2020, um, at the very early part of the COVID pandemic, we implemented a connection to a, a UK national system, something called GP Connect, which allows us to see primary care records um, from our instance of Epic. Um, <clears throat> and so where have we got to? Well, so, so we have um, a single record, pretty much everything we do is, is done in Epic, where Epic isn't the prime system because we've needed to keep it for legacy reasons related to say some bespoke or regulatory activity like uh, blood transfusion or nuclear medicine or radiotherapy, then those systems are interfaced into EPIC. So we have about 120 systems connecting to it. Um, but it, the, the pivotal thing is one view of the patient for everybody to see brings us massive safety benefits. We moved from having just over five and a half thousand PCs to just over 8,000. We've deployed a whole series of handheld devices and obviously with the COVID pandemic last year, although we had always had remote access, which was typically used by between 500 to 1000 people a day with the with the pandemic, we're now seeing um, off site access to the system somewhere in excess of two and a half thousand concurrent users per day. And at the peak of the day, um, peak of activity, we have about three and a half thousand concurrent users. All of our critical care beds, um, ventilators, physiological monitors, our theatres are connected into EPIC. And when I first wrote this slide, we had 148 critical care beds. Again, with the pandemic, that number has now increased 
to over 220 and they're all integrated. And the, the benefit of device integration is profound. It saves a lot of time for our nurses um, and really turns them back from being people transcribing information on occasions making errors, but really turns them back towards patient facing activities. And we've seen real quality improvements in the care that we've been able to deliver. And then finally, with our Biomedical Research Centre, we've done work on setting up a mobile apps factory um, framework, and that's allowed us to create patient facing apps for a number of clinical circumstances, as well as clinical trials. And in terms of benefits, well, I, I, I could talk for hours and hours, and we'd be very happy to share with you a whole raft of benefits that we've described, um, if that's helpful to you. Uh, electronic prescribing brings a whole raft of benefits. We've seen a complete abolition of safety related issues in the pediatric intensive care unit. General decision support related to uh, uh, um, prescribing based around allergies saves us at least, I think now probably more than the 850, probably approaching a thousand significant adverse drug reactions a year. And that for us, we believe is somewhere in the region of two and a half thousand to 3000 bed days a year. One of the challenges around how do you quantify these benefits is, is the value that you attribute to them. Um, at a clinical level, it's really obvious to see that avoiding all these significant adverse drug reactions is, is of benefit. Um, some of my colleagues in finance say, well, that's fine, but you haven't saved me any nurses or any beds and you haven't shut any space and you haven't reduced any costs. But, but you know, my argument is, well, we're able to do more with the same resource that we have. And um, that does need a little bit of refactoring in terms of your institution sometimes, certainly for us in a socially care funded healthcare system as to, to what is the aim of what we're trying to do over and above, obviously, improving the quality of care. Um, strict cash release and financial benefits can be sometimes quite challenging to find. Um, but we have integration to a dispensing robot, which has, has allowed us to discharge people. Critical care have a rapid response team. So we now have circumstances where nurses are filling in observations on handheld devices that generates automated warnings in the system, automatically routing messages to the rapid response team, and they're getting out to see patients much, much more quickly. And prior to the COVID pandemic, what we were seeing were the physiological Apache scores of people being admitted to our intensive care beginning to fall, suggesting that we were actually getting to these people earlier and intervening earlier with, with better outcomes. Um, and that's been very positive. And then the, where you start to get into the more complex things are related to avoidable ventilator related deaths. So there are well described international algorithms on how to ventilate people well. Um, it's a complex calculation. It's a difficult thing for anaesthetists to do on the fly, but the system does it for them now reliably several times a day automatically. And just by able, just by their own review of that information and minor tweaks to ventilation, they're seeing benefits. And then for our hospital, a whole raft of benefits, and, and I won't go um, through all of the, the fine detail here, but we shut all of our medical records. We used to pull 45,000 sets of notes a month. Um, that's now gone. Um, our clinical coding and our depth of what we call depth of diagnostic data, understanding about patients with better quality, ongoing, consistent clinical documentation, the prime aim of which is to drive good clinical care, but the subsequent consequence of which is that we're better able to bill for the complexity of care that we did deliver for our patients has led to a massive return on investment. Um, again, some challenges in the UK about how that money is actually refunded to us. Um, over five years, we should have had 87 uh, million pounds of additional income from our commissioning uh, agents. Um, unfortunately, their, their health budgets are somewhat stretched and so they haven't always been able to pay that. Um, but it again is a, is a challenging conversation sometimes when you look at the business case around these sorts of things. In essence, this clinical coding benefit in itself should have paid for what we were doing in its entirety, but because of structural challenges, um, that's not been possible. But I think probably more importantly are things like um, where there are direct funding streams, for example, for us, biological medication um, and uh, uh, special cost drugs, we are able to close the gaps in the amount of money that we were losing before due to inadequate billing purposes. And even more important, obviously, with COVID is 
the real-time bed occupancy status that we see that helps us not only manage our own internal work within the hospital, but as a regional centre has been really pivotal in helping us make sure that we can deliver better care for our patients. And a couple of slides really just to talk about the capability. I think one of the real benefits of having EPIC and the teams that you will have and the capability that you will have is that you will be able to make changes to your system as and when they suit you. You will be able to interpret your own local health needs based on uh, socioeconomic um, uh, factors and, and any other uh, local factors to decide what you do and when you do it. So this is an example of an accelerated change process during COVID. We run our hospital with a gold, silver and bronze major instant command and our infectious disease team last March said we want a new order set in the system to reflect the needs of the acute teams looking after COVID patients and they submitted it on the Wednesday and by the Friday afternoon it was built, tested and in the system and live and deployed to every clinician. So it didn't matter which clinician you were, as soon as you saw a patient with COVID, the system was prompting you with, this is the best practice, this is what you should be doing to look after these patients and investigate them. And you have absolute consistency across every team within a few hours and it makes a huge difference. We've been able to, to, to take real-time data out of um, our, our EPIC system and feed that into an algorithm uh, learning system that now is predicting for us what our forecasted activity in our ED is. And again, I know this sounds uh, in some respects very basic, but it, it means that we can much more easily predict what's coming through our ED. We've changed our staffing patterns to reflect that so that rather than have staff rostered in a very regularized way, we're doing our best to match um, activity versus resource. And for COVID um, work, here's an example of a COVID tracker. This is in click view, which is what we use for our business intelligence. And this takes real time data updated several times a day, showing our infectious disease teams, which patients have got uh, COVID, um, uh, all the details of all the swabs, they can drill down to a patient level and so on. And in fact, because we're one of the very few hospitals in the UK that can deliver this sort of data, um, so much of what we've been doing has been feeding the national um, governmental um, scientific advisory groups as to what is happening with COVID in the UK. But other things, as I mentioned earlier, is about how do we do more with healthcare for our patients? And so we've really worked on joining up healthcare. So EPIC obviously sits at the heart of that, and there are tools such as MyChart and Care Everywhere um, and EpiCare Link and GP Connect, which I've referred to earlier. But um, how have we, we, we used those? Well, my chart itself has been pivotal. Um, over a period of two years, from December 2018 to December 2020, we've signed up over 80,000 patients. Um, our haematologists and many teams are now reporting that with the use of my chart, they're able to significantly reduce the number of people attending the clinics, um, whereas a haematology clinic used to be consistently overbooked by 10 to 15 patients per clinic. It's now barely overbooked at all, and if, if so, by one or two patients. And yet the correspondence with the patients and the care with the patients is still successfully delivered. We put patients on our MyChart Design Authority. Um, the patients drive and tell us what's the functionality that they want next, um, what are the things that are going to be most useful for them. And when we moved um, a year or so back to automatic results release, whereby the patients get their results at the same time as the clinicians, um, the patients were pivotal in that. The, for us, for reasons that still aren't terribly clear to me, the clinicians who saw the fewest number of patients were the most reticent about releasing results to the patients. The patients said, these are our results, just give them to us. How can you hiding results from us help us in any possible way? Um, we release best part of 140,000 results automatically every month. We have not seen any increases in unnecessary, if you like, messaging between clinicians and patients, and our patients are much better informed and, and much happier as a consequence. And, and certainly with COVID, this has proven to be immensely valuable. And then we implemented um, uh, a, a whole series of, of, of safety uh, aspects. We, back in um, 
2018, we started a process of saying, well, we want to use barcoding technology to make our hospital safer. And this was very much driven by um, a, a desire to be a, a, a better hospital. Um, we implemented barcoding medication administration, transfusion sample collection, uh, breast milk technology from start to finish in a closed loop uh, situation. In the UK at that time, it was said that barcode medication administration a wasn't possible and b wasn't valuable and certainly we had some reticence from some of our staff um, our senior nurses were saying well we're not seeing these problems and then one day as we were implementing it a nurse gave an infusion to a patient and for whatever reason she chose to scan the patient and the drug after she'd given in the infusion at which point the system came up and said well i'm really sorry but you've now given the drug to the wrong patient um, and that sort of was a little bit of a turning point with people beginning to realize that these things were important. And so here we have um, some tools that our senior nurses are able to see every day. They're able to tell us um, when there are alerts in the system, uh, stopping the nurses from, from making errors. At the moment with COVID, we are redeploying our staff to the tune of around 50,000 hours per month of taking staff from their normal working environments and putting them somewhere else. And that is putting them in an unfamiliar and in a stressed circumstance. And what we see day to day on a background of around 11,000 administrations a day is that nurses are, um, the system is stopping nurses from making drug errors between seven and 20 times per day, every day. Um, and we again believe that that is saving us many, many thousands of lost bed days per year from adverse drug reactions. And our nurses absolutely love the system. And what they're saying is it doesn't stop me from being a nurse. It doesn't stop me from being a professional regulated individual and doing the best I can. But it does give me confidence that the system is going to support me to do the right thing for my patient. We built digital support tools based on sepsis. Um, it will be, many of you will be familiar with this, but basically through very strong digital engagement and very strong engagement with our acute medicine and our emergency care team, we built tools in the system that tell the doctors and the nurses when the patient arrives, there are constellations of clinical parameters in the system that help the patient that, that, that would lead you to believe this patient has sepsis. And you can see the outcomes here of of increases in antibiotics uh, being administered within one hour. We know that for every hour of delay, there's a seven to 8% increase in mortality. So this is having real benefit. And certainly for us, the calculations from 2018 and 19 suggest that we have at least 64 lives saved. And that's ongoing and has now become part of the standard fabric of our building and our institution. <laughs> And again, when we talk about value from healthcare, these are some of the tweets from some of our patients about how well they're doing as a consequence of the work that we did around sepsis. And we, again, um, find it challenging to find cash releasing benefits, but we can describe quality, safety, safety timeliness, effectiveness, equity, patient-centered uh, uh, benefits that can be described at length. So back in 2014, just before we went live, we were a HIMSS stage one hospital. For those of you not familiar, this is their inpatient EMR adoption model that describes how, how well you use digital tools to support your system. It's a measure of system adoption, not a measure of what you've turned on. So you need to be sure that your clinicians are aware and are using this. And we went from stage one to stage six, just within, um, a year of go live by 2015. By 2018, HIMS had made the criteria even more difficult, and so we revalidated at stage six. And then last year, we were very pleased to become the first UK hospital for inpatient care to validate at stage seven, and only the seventh hospital in Europe. And I think it really, again, the important thing here is that this is a measure of how well your staff are using the system. And it's the staff really that I just want to finish on as I, as I talk for a few minutes more. None of the work that you do is going to make any effect or be um, valuable if your staff aren't engaged with what you do and you can't bring them along with you. And this is an annual survey that we've run for the last few years. We, we didn't quite manage to do it last year with COVID, but we're picking it up again this year. And you can see over time 
how things have changed as we've gone through the delivery of our, 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 through our, our journey. And not everything has been perfect. When we first started, you can see that the score for um, the support that was available was a negative net promoter score. And whilst it's improved over the years to plus 39, I'd still like it to be better. We had problems in 2019 with log on times and we've changed our infrastructure provider and that has improved substantially. But the reality is that um, all of the benefits that I've talked about, all of the tools that I've talked about, all of the things that we could talk about are only deliverable because of the engagement from your staff. So when I think about the lessons that you might take away from this, first of all, um, digital is, is not a bolt on. Doing this re reflects an underpinning change in mindset. And this was one of the, the challenges that I don't think that our NHS recognized back in 2014 when we first did this. And although at the point that Keith was leaving and to, to return to yourselves in 2017, the NHS was very happy to say what a great job he and we and others had done. The time between 2014 and 2017 had been very difficult for us and we got a lot of adverse publicity for, for, for doing that. And I would still do the same thing again. I believe it was absolutely the right thing, but I think our NHS has become a much more educated NHS over the time. And you will obviously be able to learn and, and benefit from, from work that uh, others have done before you in Australia. It's absolutely imperative that you understand your staff and their roles, and you need to be able to describe what I call the who, what, the when, and the why. All of those things are clinical, administrative, and operational, sometimes professionally regulated, local, national guidance, whatever it is. All of those things are things that you need to be able to describe because EPIC typically becomes the how. And we still on occasions will see change requests from from staff saying, I would like to do X in the system, imagining that just because you, you build X in the system, that that will somehow magically make everybody do what it is that they're supposed to do. And it doesn't. Um, we had a request from the hand physiotherapist saying, it'd be really great if the plastic surgeons would fill in this 15 screen referral form because it would make our life really easier. Um, the response from the plastic surgeons was substantially shorter than 15 pages in length. Um, and as you might imagine, and nobody had bothered to talk to them or understand that. And so if, if clinical teams can't agree on those operational workflows, then the technology is not going to fix that. For staff engagement, going live, change management, make it real. Um, too much engagement is not enough. The things that we found to be very, very beneficial were dress rehearsals, looking at um, operational readiness. And by that, I mean, for every clinical and operational person in every clinical and operational area, do they know what they're supposed to be doing? Have they got the equipment that they need to do it? And does the equipment fit in that space? So we had our executives pretending to be patients. Our COO, she pretended to be a lady having twins. Um, she came into the ED, was wheeled to the maternity hospital, went into the theatre. One baby went to the NICU, one baby went to the ward. And in the midst of all of that, it was only then we realised that there wasn't now enough physical space in the theatre for the resuscitation equipment, the computers, the operating tables and so on. And so, so the more that you can practise those dress rehearsals, the better. And in terms of making it real, I think it's really important that staff understand that there isn't an abstract separation between your hospital and your community. Your hospital and your community are the same. At any time, a staff member or their family member or whoever might be a patient. Um, we've seen that obviously with, with, with COVID, but even before that, um, you know, my, my son was born in the Rosie Hospital. When I fractured my wrist many years ago, it was fixed at Addenbrooke's. My wife has been seen at Addenbrooke's. The, the notion that the staff and the patients are different is not real. And everybody needs to recognise that the pursuit of ever increasing high quality care is a benefit for all of us as a community. And this is not just about changing your institution in an abstract way. So the last thing really, just to re reiterate what I said about defining value and measuring benefits, think about how and what you want to do in terms of that. So for us, as I say, cash releasing benefits are hard, but quality, safety, efficiency are, are, are very much stronger. 
There are a few more slides in there which I've left um, just for reference, really, which is looking about the things that we want to do um, going forward. But I'm going to stop there. Um, as I say, I could talk for hours. We've got lots and lots of material that we're very happy to share with you. Um, and um, I hope that that's been helpful. Thank you. I'm just going to stop sharing my screen. Wonderful. Uh, look, thank you, Afzal. Uh, we might have a few questions which we might uh, harass you with via email later on. Um, moving on, our next speaker is uh, Mallory Heinzeroth from EPIC. Um, Mallory is the Asia Pacific Regional Executive, um, a healthcare software company who's really keeping patients at the heart of their design. Um, Mallory's led the EPIC implementations at some, what's this small hospital, Mayo Clinic, never heard of them, uh, in the US, has been involved in the Parkville uh, implementation as well. Um, and in that lovely phrase of turn that Epic has, she is our customer happiness executive. So Mallory, over to you for DHR implementation. Thank you, Peter. It's always tough to follow off, so he's a wonderful speaker and does a in some ways a better job explaining Epic than I do. Uh, all right, I'm gonna wrap up the presentation part of the day today. So um, I'm gonna move through a couple of different sections uh, today. I wanna tell you a little bit about who Epic is, um, a little bit about what types of things you can expect from us um, in the system and both from the team. And then also just a little bit about what, what the last year has looked like for us. I think it's really important uh, it's a really important characterization of who we are as a company, um, how we've responded to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so I'll, that, is, that is what you can expect in the next uh, 15 to 20 minutes. I told Peter I would make it quicker than I was planning. Um, so I'll take some questions at the end and be around if you have any questions about what we have today. Uh, so EPIC, uh, much, much is in a name. Um, we are not an all capital acronym, uh, as I will show you in a second, but we are a glorious account of a patient's event instead of a nation's event, um, as history might see. And we really, that is really important to who we are because it is core to how we design our software. We started in this building in 1979 uh, in the basement. We had two little offices down here in the corner where my head is, so you probably can't see them. Uh, and that is where we designed Epic. It, originally, this is Judy, uh, our founder. Uh, 40 years ago, she uh, both had her daughter and started Epic, uh, as you know it today. Uh, we started as a database company, though. She's a computer science uh, major by background. Um, she didn't have any business experience and had no idea we were going into healthcare. Um, but we developed a database, uh, and somebody said, this is amazing. You should use this for a longitudinal patient record. She was like, why? Like, she had no, no concept. Uh, and then did some shadowing, and we ended up creating Epic with a longitudinal patient record and really with the patient at the center of everything that we do. Uh, a funny story. Um, many of the cab drivers in Madison get to know all of you as you come into Verona to visit that UGM uh, that I think uh, you saw mentioned a couple of times. Um, and uh, we oftentimes get fun acronyms made up. Uh, this is my favorite one uh, that a, a cab driver um, shared with one of our staff on their way in. Um, but we really, we really are not uh, in a conquest of the galaxies, but uh, here about healthcare. Uh, we're employee owned. Um, we have company or offices in all of the countries you see along the bottom here. Uh, the staff and the team that will be supporting you are primarily going to be based out of Melbourne, which is great. Most of them are on their way into the country now. Um, and then you'll have support from all around the globe so that really you have a, a consistent experience and consistent support regardless of the hour of the day and the time. Uh, you'll get to know your staff well, and they'll be here like me uh, celebrating with you as we go. Our mission at Epic, I realize this is a little hard to see maybe at the bottom, but our mission at Epic, one of the things we always tell our first staff on their very first day, they come through an orientation, and I've been reflecting on this because we've been doing orientation for the last two weeks for the whole DHR team, and we always tell our staff that they're heroes helping heroes. Their job is to make sure that you as clinicians, the people who are on the front lines, taking care of the patients every day, 
you know, the person who is helping a person check in when they're really worried about their health and they're trying to figure out where their Medicare card is that they left in the car. Um, you are the people that matter. You are the heroes making the patient's journey better and helping them get better. Um, so this is our mission. This is who we are. This is how we want to help you. I can't actually see this. I'm too short, so sorry. I'm realizing I have to look in different places. Um, the, so this is our software factory. Um, we have built everything that you will see in Epic. Um, it's all uh, developed in-house, so we don't um, acquire other, other vendors or companies. And I think you'll see that as a part of the integrated nature of the software. Um, we have teams throughout the campus that are all together. So um, you'll, you'll hear people walking down the hallways going, oh, I'm working on this. Wait a minute, you're working on that? We should do that together. Um, so it's been a really great uh, environment to be creative and help make sure that the software ends up being a joy for you to use. Uh, we are builders and innovators. Uh, I wanted to share this just as our principles. Uh, we have our 10 commandments, our 10 principles, um, and our values that are posted up in the bathrooms and in the break rooms and in the hallways around campus. Um, and these are the 10 principles that we carry forward into everything that we do. And I think a couple of these are really important for you as clinicians, as users, as administrative staff, as people as a part of the project team um, to know. We really want to make sure that our projects are a joy for you to use and that they're helping you be efficient. Uh, we also keep our commitments. So if we tell you we will do something, we will do it. And if we don't, we will fix it and we will say sorry for why, uh, why we did. But I will tell you that your staff will be here to meet their commitments to you to being able to use Epic in an effective and safe way. So that's a little bit about Epic. Uh, on to our software here quickly. So um, this is a little bit of a complex side, but I wanted to show you all of the different features and functionality and areas that our software covers. Uh, that one unifi unified platform in the middle represents that database that I told you Judy developed in the basement. Um, that is the core of everything we do. Um, it's obviously gotten better over time. Uh, it's not exactly the same, but that represents kind of where we started. And then all of these features and functions are a part of Epic and designed around that patient so that you as the clinician get that one easy to find view and then able ability to support your patients. This one is a little bit simpler. So this is all of those little things into major categories. Um, so we really focus on that patient's experience, your ability to use the software, um, being connected outside of the walls of the hospital because the reality is that's not where the most care needs to happen anymore. Um, or it never did, but we're now realizing that as a healthcare industry and changing the tools to better support that. So just very quickly, this is what I, I think of when I think of Epic and we tell the story of Epic. So the patient is at the middle. We design all of those tools that you need as a clinician or a specialist around it. Um, the ability to book in patients, schedule follow-ups, refer to other places. We give the patients all the tools in the middle um, to be able to be engaged in their own care. We then connect you and the, and the community. So uh, I'll show you a few of the tools we use for that. Uh, get you outside of the walls of the healthcare network that is yours and into those unusual um, but unique and important spaces where care needs to happen. Uh, and then we actually connect you to all of the things that are not traditionally considered healthcare, but that are the social determinants of health that impact how, how a patient can do over time and how they impact their own care. This is what that web ends up looking like. We can share these with you so you don't have to take all of the pictures, but that web then turns into a bigger picture where now we can connect hospitals and healthcare organizations and clinics and GPs uh, if somebody from, he from here goes to uh, London or Britain and they end up needing to be seen at one of our organizations there, the, all of that patient's record can be transferred and visible uh, for that, those clinicians to see all of that same uh, history that you have on the patient as well. 
It's interoper interoperable with non-EPIC locations too. I know we talk a lot about EPIC because that's who I am. Uh, but uh, as we talk about Keith and Queensland, if you head over to Queensland and you need to uh, be able to have your record available in Cerner, we have tools to be able to connect them as well. And then anyone with a connection worldwide can have access to your same longitudinal record. And we call this WorldWise. These are the tools we use to connect those. I'm not going to go into those today because I want to get to the most important part. Uh, we, these are some of the tools we use for interoperability. Um, and as I get into COVID, I wanted to just share one story about um, another tool we developed that came out of sort of a, a crisis for one of our customers. We had a group working in the Middle East who was managing refugee camps, and they were having a really hard time getting the patients their record to go home because they didn't have uh, the World Wide Web, uh, they didn't have internet connection, and they also didn't know where that person was gonna go. So we developed an on the USB drive a patient chart so that somebody could get care and then take that USB with them and be able to have their record uh, at the next place they needed to go. I'm going to skip my chart for a minute. Uh, we will use my chart as a tool for those patients to stay, for your patients and consumers to stay engaged. As we move into some of the response in, in COVID, we talked a lot about telehealth and how to get the right care to the patient at the right time. We developed, we had some of these tools developed and then we developed extensibility platforms in the last year to be able to expand the capabilities of telehealth exponentially. Um, Par uh, Parkville and the Children's, they actually increased their telehealth about 80%, um, so your next door neighbors. Um, these are just a few stories from some of the groups who have used telehealth to continue to care for their patients and I will share these later. And I will talk a little bit about our research network, but overall, we think that this is here to stay. Um, while telehealth may decrease a bit because we do need to get back into doing some of those in-person screenings, um, mammograms are one of the things at the top of our list. Uh, for any kind of um, ongoing treatments, we do think that telehealth will be around for us for a while. I'm gonna skip the video, so tech folks skipping the video. I will share this afterward as well, but we provide tools for you operationally to have access to data and also uh, to provide data to anyone else that you're working with in the community. And this is just a representation of our community. You've heard about it a bit already in the presentations today. All right, quick update on 2020 and then I will give it back to Peter. Uh, we, we think that our job in healthcare is to make sure that regardless of what's going on in the world, you have the tools to be able to care for the patients in the best way possible and that we're making it efficient for you. In 2020, we did quite a few things to make delivering care, contact tracing, providing results, getting people scheduled for vaccines easier. Um, we also acknowledge that the strain on the healthcare system was great, and so we needed to make it easier for either you to put tools in to make it easier for, for you and your patients, or we needed to make it uh, very low cost or free because people did not have disposable, uh, disposable budgets in 2020. I wanted to show you one story about a group in New York. Um, we worked with New York Consortium, and in New York, the total, death, the total death rate above normal was exponentially higher than the rest of the US. So that yellow peak is New York City alone in terms of exponential rate of death higher in this 2020 year than anywhere else in the United States. And they were one of the groups that came to us and said, you have to help us figure out how to vaccinate people quicker because we are terrified this will happen again. Um, so uh, we went out and helped them stand up a vaccination center. Um, and in the first three days, they vaccinated 40,000 patients. Sorry, I'll get through my animation here. Uh, this is a very quick overview of what their uh, vaccination center looked like, and it became a little factory of getting people in and out, uh, but they were able to vaccinate. Uh, they're now up to about 10,000 patients in a day if they have the supply. So just a few pictures of what that looked like and of their overall vaccination center. 
uh, we're turning uh, quite a few stadiums in the US into vaccination centers as well. All right, the last thing is our uh, health research network. So one of the other great things about 2020, it was a hard year, but there were some great things that came from it, is that we realized the community, both the EPIC community and the non-EPIC community was just so vast and talented and had all of these tools. But to Keith's point earlier, uh, sometimes we get stuck in silos instead of horizontal sharing of information. Um, and it was taking too long to get information out. So we set up the Epic Health Research Network. Um, this is a, t a tool where anyone across the community can publish studies, findings, um, hunches and get input on their research or provide their research so others can start uh, potentially taking action on that and making decisions for that. Um, so these are just a couple of the research studies that came out um, in the last year. And I think just fundamentally for us, we care about you because you care for your patients. And again, we're those heroes helping you be heroes. Um, so our goal in working with you and working around the globe is that at the end of the day, we're helping patients get healthy and helping future generations be healthier as well. That was not quite as quick as you wanted, Peter, but hopefully fast enough. Uh, and I will uh, be around for questions. Wonderful. Thanks, Mallory. Um, and as we've said before, Mallory will be around after to answer questions afterwards. More importantly, there'll be food and drink as well. So you can sort of pin her in a corner and uh, a bribe with food and drink and she can answer all the questions you might have. Um, now we go into the panel session um, and we've got a few extra questions we'll ask as we come forward. Um, in the program, which you all have, are the full bios for our four panellists. But in the meantime, I might invite them to join me on the stage. So first of all, we have Dr. Nick, Nick Coatsworth, the Executive Director of Medical Services at Canberra Health Services. Um, Anthony Domkins, the ACT Health Chief Nursing and Midwifery Officer. Um, Dean Hewson, who we've met earlier from Healthcare Consumers Association. And last, but by no means least, Jennifer Azurin, um, who about, what, two weeks ago, I poached from Calvary to come and join the Digital Health Record team. So grab a seat. There's a, a seat for each of us. We've all got microphones and glasses of water and all those wonderful things. And I might start off with some questions. Um, feel free to add more questions on Slido. We'll have people roaming the corridors for those in the, uh, the space here at ANU with microphones as well um, to put questions for people. But we might start, first of all, uh, Jennifer. So. You're on the tender evaluation team and you discovered the joy of traveling with me, which is no sleep and far too many days to work. Um, and you saw Epic being used in a variety of other health services. As you've worked, I suppose, across the whole ACT public health system in clinical, administrative and management roles, um, what are your main concerns about the implementation of the Epic and the DHR in the ACT? Mm. My mic's on, yeah. Yep. Um, firstly, I guess I'd like to reassure people, if it, you haven't been reassured already from the previous speakers, that my main concern does not relate to the EPIC system at all. Um, all the sites that I visited, Peter, um, and you visited too, as you know, reassured us of how configurable it is to our requirements. Um, it's so exceptionally configurable that probably the other issue is keeping things standardised. And they have a proven success record in hundreds of organisations for the last four decades. So it's not at all my concern uh, for the EPIC system. All my concerns relate to the change management process. And if I may be a little bit more specific, to roll out a project of this enormity will require pretty much all of us in the healthcare system to be engaged in some form. Not just the SMEs, but we'll be training, um, we'll, people will be asked some information, and much of that will be at very short notice. So Peter did apologise earlier on. Um, it is necessary to build this system as best as we can um, and as safest as we can on go live. So um, this, the successful impl implementation does require us to be respectful with one another and compassionate with one another as well for this big project. It is already going to be tough enough as it is. Um, so we, we, we want to hold steadfast in our organisational values as we relate to each other as well, hopefully in kindness and compassion as we go forward. 
So that is um, one of my biggest concerns. A second concern I have relates more to the build and joining the dots. So we will be the first in the nation to implement an EPIC PaaS system. There's a lot of work around that in capturing the information that we, we require. Of course, that needs to be integrated um, and linked to the patient assessments and the patient interventions and treatments that we do, which will then need to link that information with the analytics and reporting um, as well. So Justine is here and so she knows, I know that you are worried about this. So that reporting is of course required for legislative requirements, for funding, cost recovery, et cetera. And those jots, dots need to join together in the build um, and to have that bird's eye view, not just the siloed view as this is, this is my territory, that's all I care for. It does need to go across as well. Um, the third one, and I'm glad Kath spoke because I've had this concern, as you know, Peter, from the very start, is the governance of allied health. Um, allied health in the ACT is special with 30 or so different disciplines across the territory and governing that and making sure that all the uh, individual disciplines are catered to, but at the same time, there are certain things that need to be standardized so that we do compare apples with apples. For example, Allied Health is very much involved with group programs. So are those group programs being captured the same way across Allied Health? Um, and the final one is becoming less of a concern, Peter, mainly because of your reassurances to me. And that is essentially the upgrading of very old infrastructure and the upgrading of devices too. And I'm especially concerned, of course, from my home in Calvary. Um, some of the older buildings in, across the territory are in Calvary facilities, but I do know that there's work in progress to get that upgraded well in time before go live. Now, saying all these concerns, I know for a fact that the digital health record team is led by some very dynamic, very bright and highly resilient leaders. These guys didn't sleep at all. <laughs> I don't, I'm sure they didn't sleep at all during the tender process. I also am very much assured from the site visits and from our recent interactions with the EPIC team that they are amazing. They'll be holding our hand along the way. They're so helpful and you can clearly see their culture is absolutely exemplary. And I know for a fact as well that in the audience today and at the operational level, we have exceptional uh, clinical and non-clinical leaders who I'm really hoping that we'll all band together for something that will transform and contemporize our healthcare uh, service right across the territory. Wonderful. <laughs> I get the feeling that speech just cost me more money somehow, but anyway, uh, thanks Jennifer. And look, for those of you who haven't seen uh, Level 4 at, uh, at Calvary at the Xavier Building, brand new ICT network going in, brand new nurse call system that's rolling out across Xavier, going through mental health and ED and so forth. So I think it's really good to see that, in, that investment in the infrastructure. Canberra Health Services were out to roll out 2,000 clinical work devices, so clinical grade smartphones. It's really exciting to see this ongoing investment in infrastructure across the territory. So I think it really sets us up well. Continuing across the stage, because that way it helps me keep in mind where I'm up to. Um, Dean, the, we, we've heard a little bit about sort of my chart, the patient portal today from Epic. Um, and we're going to implement that in the ACT. So it's a website and secure portal and also apps for those with, with phones. Um, it'll give consumers a lot more visibility of their own health information, upcoming appointments, results and so forth. What do you see some of the opportunities of utilising that technology in the future could actually bring for patients and their own sort of control of their own destiny? Thanks, Peter. Um, so first a disclaimer. So some of these will be a little bit pie in the sky and some of them will actually probably already be in the system, um, but I won't be aware of them just yet. So I think uh, it's across sort of three main areas. I think we want, we want to help people understand, we want to help people connect, uh, and we want to help people to help each other. So going through some of those, um, what I mean by that, so we've got, we've got lots of opportunity for changing how we um, engage with health professionals. So there's um, opportunities for a bit more prep work to happen before a, a, a consultation occurs. There's opportunities for sharing information with um, consumers and helping connect and link them to um, other information, so you can connect people to you know the instructions for use. You can connect people to various um, lists of side effects and that sort of thing. Um, 
but that's all relatively basic. What I'm really hoping that this can do over time is um, help people understand where they fit in the bigger picture, help people understand what steps they could be taking next, um, and help people know what their clinicians are looking for from them, um, with the potential even for sort of two-way communication at some point in the future, should funding models ever support that sort of um, approach to work. Um, in terms of help, I'd like to see, um, you could use something like this to even show people opportunities to help more within their own, within the health system. So it could be as simple as, um, you know, just letting them give some feedback, or it could be as complex as, would you like to join this design project to improve this particular part of um, our health system? So it's a, there are opportunities for other ways of engaging with people beyond just the sort of more standard ways that we've become used to. Um, this is gonna be a slightly heretical for someone from uh, health consumers to, to, to say, but there's, you know, there are more ways to engage than um, through governance committees and um, even basic user research. There's opportunities for finding ideas um, out among the public, even among um, health professionals, and then combining them, bringing them together, um, and driving innovation that way, not just um, through the more formal processes that we're used to. Um, and in terms of connecting, I mean, there's, there's always a question with any platform about where you draw the boundaries of the interface and where you let people take information out and bring it back in. There's always going to need to be carefully managed, but I think there's a lot of, uh, a lot of scope potentially for helping people understand how to engage with other processes they might need to get help with. So there's, you know, there's social prescribing, which was mentioned, but there's more specifically things like helping them prepare for an NDIS assessment, um, helping them collect their information for a workers' compensation or, or, or similar. Um, which would then, when we take that sort of approach, we're looking at a, um, a method of engaging people that isn't just um, about the, the, the points along the, along the way. So it's not just about the appointment, uh, appointments or whatever else, it's about what are your outcomes that you're trying to achieve and it's about um, what issue are you trying to solve. All those little dots make up that bigger picture. Um, so you know, with, with by, by bringing that together and by even changing how we communicate and think about it, I think we're going to end up at a much more consumer-centred system purely through um, taking a more longitudinal approach to um, how we're trying to improve and improve people's health. Excellent. I think it's an exciting world we're looking forward to. Um, and I'm, I must also confess the, the other bit of news is that we start work next month on the saying do the design work for the my chart the patient portal mm. um, to kick that work off so we're we're starting in front and center with the project focus around what healthcare consumers see and how it will work for them so i think that should hopefully set up the program really well for the future so looking forward to working very closely with healthcare consumers association but also outside governance committees uh, very much so um continuing along um nick Doctors at times can be very reluctant to move from using their own specialty clinical systems that they spent many years sort of perfecting and, and getting just where they needed to be across to an integrated digital health record. What would you say to sort of those doctors who are watching, who are feeling anxious about moving away from their bespoke clinical systems for their specialty to a more general sort of DHR? Oh, well, uh, I mean, I guess, Peter, the first thing I'd say is I completely acknowledge that uh, a lot of people have put a lot of time into designing these uh, in, in such a way that <clears throat> really fits the needs of their patients. So uh, that's, that's the first thing. Then um, I would say that from what, I, what I've heard today, and I'm learning about Epic as well, uh, every time I go to a new um, thing like this, uh, is that uh, there's, there's no barrier in using what you've created um, to be part of EPIC. You've got the foundation system, but there's an ability to take your experience and um, build something really cool. Um, it's just that everybody else gets to see it. Um, and, and that to me is the most important thing. I mean, you know, to be honest, there are things that I need to see about my patients in infectious diseases that sit in other databases and I can't give them the care that I need um, because it's not, it's not fully integrated. So whilst there may, may appear to be a, a, a cost, um, some of that cost um, can be um, mitigated. Um, and the other thing is, of course, that means involvement and engagement. Um, so that if, if you're listening or in your, you're in the room and you have your own uh, systems uh, for your own craft group patients, then the answer is 
to influence the process um, by being involved both at, at, at the unit level um, and of course your units will need individuals and subject matter experts. I, ju I just wanted to say there one, one other thing just sort of pivoting a little bit to, um, to clinical engagement and, and what that looks like. Firstly, this is gonna be, it, it is clearly gonna be a, a difficult uh, process with very set timeframes. But one of the ways to keep engaged, I, I think that resonated with me was uh, the idea that we just reinforced that this is a clinical project. This is the biggest clinical project we've ever done. And I hadn't seen it framed like that. That was really helpful. It's not an IT project. You'll hear me, I think now I will just be saying that every day for the next 365 <laughs> days. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, that means really um, that we want everybody to be given the time and the space uh, to be able to do this. And that means that from at an executive level, we need to make sure together that we have a common understanding of what that means for individual clinicians and unit directors, uh, what it means for people taking time off in those, Peter said, there are gonna be periods where you don't hear from uh, Epic at all. And then there will be some very concentrated periods where you might not get to see a patient for a couple of days. Now, what does that mean? How, how much assistance do we provide lots in helping plan for that in advance so uh, our subject matter experts can be made available? So that's something that I'll definitely be focused on and, and I know that uh, my, um, my colleagues in the clinical executive directors are also aware of that. Excellent. I, I, I think I need to put something on the bottom of my email signature block. This is not an IT project. <laughs> I th and I, th I think if that's the number one thing that everyone takes away from today, that really is the thing. This is not IT. This is not about widgets. This is about patients and about clinicians. And this is a clinical transformation project. So thank you for that, Nick. Um, Tony, nurses and midwives are often uh, probably the largest cohort of sort of the, the health workforce. Uh, and we have many who work across a range of different settings in camp, sort of justice health right through to community health and then through to sort of the most acute services that are, that are offered. How do you think the ability to access patient information on mobile devices will change those workflows? Um, I, I think um, that the beauty of EPIC, um, having previous experience in implementing an um, um, electronic medical record, is that you'll be able to capture the patient experience from the time they come to the emergency department through the intensive care into the ward and then back into the community. And that point, point of care uh, where a nurse or a midwife can drill down at that particular point of care will ensure decreased risk to the client. And uh, I think that is the beauty of, of EPIC. I also think by using your own devices that there's a greater um, um, aspect in relation to confidentiality and and because in previous IT platforms you've been able to go and access um, p uh, other clients um, medical records. I also believe that with an EPIC they've safeguarded the nurse and midwife not to cut and paste and there's a safeguard on the time frame that you um, that you can log, uh, log in and out. So they are some of the experiences that, that I've experienced that have left um, an organisation vulnerable but above all uh, I'm, I'm having to translate patient care um, does lead, uh, uh, lead then to um, a, a decrease in continuity of care and that translation leaves the patient exposed. But I do think that that, uh, that, they, that the nurse and midwife will be able to drill down to point of care at that particular time to ensure that, that they have an appreciation of the multidisciplinary care plan that nurses and midwives do execute because they are there to 24/7, so I think it's a I think it's a great concept. I, I think you need to be con be congratulated. And the only uh, other aspect that uh, I would like just to highlight is that that um, some some. I think we may forget or maybe not fully appreciate that not all nurses and midwives are. are are IT savvy and that um, even the basics of turning on the computer, and I'm not, I'm talking for myself, I had a sec, <laughs> I've always had a secretary, so I've been blessed. But um, I, I, I think if you pitch some of the education up here, which we did, I, I think there's some fundamental of IT platform that you really need to um, appreciate to get the full benefits out of, um, of EPIC or 
as we'll try and find a workaround. But uh, I do think it will change the way we work. I think it will enhance the patient experience. But the fact that an that a nurse and midwife can drill down to point of care at that particular time with a full clinical picture will really enhance the patient experience. It will decrease fragmentation and duplication and provide efficiencies for, for nurses and midwives to really ensure better, best practice and safe practice at the bedside. Excellent. Um, I think the, the, the range of tools we're going to give nurses to really help them and assist them, I think it's going to be like a revelation that they've suddenly got access to all this information we've never made available to them before. Yeah. And I think there's almost, for me, the most exciting part of that also is the community nurses at the moment where often they'll go out and sort of the, 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 the healthcare consumer keeps the file at home, staff member travels from point to point and the file stays in their home. The fact that that's going to be revolutionised and these staff will be able to do it on a smartphone as they go out to their home, sort of record it, take a photo of the wound, check medications, look up results. All while providing that clinical care, I think will really transform that care. I think it's a really exciting thing. Also, I think it will strengthen other services where some people may be vulnerable, such as hospital in the home, where they know they'll have a connectedness to the acute care sector. The medical start team can also be involved. So. I I really do think the benefits from a community perspective, primary and community health and hospital and the home is where care should be, will be strengthened because of EPIC. And so there have, as I said previously, not all systems have always in other states and territories been an interface, but this will, and I, and I think it would be wonderful if we commence some form of research uh, from the outset of your implementation and the findings with some KPIs to measure the success. But our learned colleague down here had it exactly right. If we start off in stages with what's the intent of EPIC and then build upon the platforms, uh, I think you the last thing you want is staff to be so overwhelmed and, and disillusioned that they're learning about the IT system, not necessarily the full be uh, 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 benefits of a staged approach, which you have planned, Peter, and are, su are supported by the team is excellent. Excellent. I don't think I need to give everyone $20 as you leave tonight. <laughs> Done well. Um, <laughs> that can cost me a whole lot more looking across the room. Um, so a question I'll let any of the panellists here decide who wants to, to chime in on this one. Uh, clinical leadership may talk about patient experience but often takes action based mostly on regulatory compliance needs. How can the DHR change this? Can you just repeat the question? Clinical leadership may talk about patient experience but often takes action based mostly on regulatory compliance needs. So how can the DHR change that focus? Well, I, I, I'm happy to go first, uh, but I think we should all answer, just in case. <laughs> just spread the load a little bit. Um, I'll look, uh, I, I guess I see where the um, premise of the question's coming from. And I think that if we, um, you know, what, are you, what, what data points are we trying to get out of the um, DHR to improve care? Um, it, this is about things that we already have to demonstrate, um, adherence to national standards, because uh, our quality and safety standards do actually form a, a really strong base from where we can deliver uh, high quality, exceptional um, patient care. So I'm not sure if the question was framed to include those as the sort of regulatory compliance sort of things, but I, I don't see them so much as, as regulatory compliance, but um, the building blocks of, of quality patient care. So I think it, for, for me, it's about changing the focus into what are we defining? Um, what, what are the national um, definitions of quality patient care? And we've got things that we need to report against. But then we've got the opportunity to define what we think is um, excellent patient care and innovative patient care. And I think the DHR um, has the opportunity um, to really um, enable that sort of process. I agree. I think it will further enhance compliance and it's the way that we develop the EPIC platform to capture and ensure safeguard quality care to our clients. So I think at the moment it's quite fluid and, um, and, it, and to be honest, 
I've only been here recently. It's very hard to ascertain data. There's a lot of data, data systems. And, it, and um, so I think this will actually secure and enhance compliance and we'll be able to build the platforms against legislation, policy, procedure that will safeguard good patient care, but also the reputational risk of the organisation. So I think it will enhance same. It's, yep. uh, the clinicians are building the system, not the legislators. Uh, and also EPIC have e excellent clinical decision tools uh, as well that has been based on best practice. And we'll be looking at those tools and building on that as well. And you've seen from the outcome data from the other facilities that have implemented EPIC, none of that really relates to legislation. It's about uh, patients and it's about staff. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm not worried about that aspect at all, although it's important to look at the legislation and whatnot, but this really is a clinical project. Absolutely, and, and clearly someone's thinking I'm getting off lightly here, because I've got a question that says, Peter, do you think CHS presents any particular or unique challenges in terms of this EPIC installation? The answer is yes. <laughs> um, CHS is a big health system, a health service that provides a whole range of services, everything from sort of community-based services right through to sort of the subacute, the acute, justice health, alcohol and drug services. The complete range of disciplines and services provided by CHS is absolutely a challenge. Is it insurmountable? No. No. Um, is it going to make us all work harder? Yes. But does it also hopefully mean that we'll actually have a more joined up solution yeah. that actually is focused on the individual patients at the heart of everything? Yeah. I would have said yes. So do I think it presents a challenge? That's it. Nick? Um, whilst um, we're getting the mic to um, Lisa up there, who's got a, got a question, <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll just... Um, I just think also it's, um, you know, clearly um, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, the person who posed the question has had some challenges in mind um, and they should be clearly articulated and acknowledged. The ones that come to my mind is, you know, we're um, doing, uh, we're constructing this from um, the ACT Health Directorate and CHS is a different directorate. Um, but this is a really good example of, of coming together and I'm starting to um, engage with colleagues that I haven't worked with before. So I think that's surmountable. I think the medical engagement is a real issue. We know it is within the organisation. So how do we generate that excitement? So that, and that applies as much to building the CSB as it does to EPIC. So I'm thinking I leave these, you know, um, presentations very, very charged and excited about the possibilities, but it's no good if it's just, if that's not a shared sort of thing. So medical engagement's important. We're beyond medicine. We're going through uh, some incremental improvements in our culture, which we see in our pulse surveys, but we, that's going to impact. So we've got to be clear about calling those um, roadblocks out because otherwise we're not going to be able to get over them um, and definitely not papering over them. Uh, and if people have those sort of concerns, then um, raise them, ask how, firstly ask how it's going to be addressed, but also suggest some ways that it might be addressed as well. I think I'd just like to add to that, um, and similar to the, the last question as well, I mean, regulatory, regulatory compliance is about meeting the minimum bar, but I've not met many clinicians, health professionals or consumers that are happy with just the minimum. So the more opportunities we can create for continuous improvement for fixing both you know, the micro and the macro issues that we all can recognise, um, the more we're going to be able to bring the whole system up towards you know, the top of what's possible, not just um, meeting that minimum standard. Absolutely. And, and I think if, if the benefits, the true benefits of EPIC are, are promoted at a, at a medical staff council, I think they will see a connectedness between specialties. And I'm not talking for Canberra Health Services, but where hence I came, they were a big hospital and they worked in silos, they worked in divisions. And if you are in justice health, there are some complex medical, mental health issues that need to be addressed. So that referral pathway, that connected with the acute mental health team to support clients who are in a justice health environment is one example of, of how that can further enhance the experience to, to our, our recovery. And if there is an interface with the patient journey boards, 
then that will just be absolutely excellent that we'll be able to cross-reference our, our referrals and the uh, registrar will be able to go online and see the patient experience and why uh, uh, um, or, or what the history is. So I think it will create a, a, a greater connectedness within the organisational structure that sometimes can be uh, focused within their specialty. And cancer and palliative care, for example, or uh, reaching out to Calvary because they've got a palliative care service and some of it is driven through Canberra Health. So uh, I think I think there will be the, the flow on benefits of a greater connectedness between uh, ACT Health, uh, Calvary and Canberra Health Services. Absolutely. Um, so, Lisa, up the back, we, we've, we've left you sitting there with the microphone for too long. Let's go. No, that's all right. Thank you for um, flagging my waving hand, Nick. Um, I'm, my name's Lisa Bell. I'm the uh, Acting Health Director at Calvary Hospital. Um, as a clinician, so I've worked in the ACT for 17 years. As a clinician, I constantly, every day, um, are frustrated by on our crazy electronic record system that ICU and CCU have at Calvary uh, versus the paper-based system. Get frustrated at a whole lot of things that happen with patients as they are going through their illness that seem to drop off from one day to the next. So someone flags something on day one or day four, but by day seven and um, Dean, I'm no, Dean, yes, I'm really sorry to flag this and you probably know this happens anyway. But by day seven, those things that were flagged on day one or day four have actually been forgotten about. And so the concept of a digital health record is so exciting because I have this fantastic, you know, image of those things not getting lost. But I... I wonder how that from a practical point, so maybe, and I'm terribly sorry, but I've forgotten your name from Epic, um, might be able to describe how that from a practical point of view is flagged so that I as a clinician and my colleagues, nursing, medical, allied health, all of them, uh, pharmacy, need to throw in there, um, could go in when they go to see the patient, there's a little list that sort of like an action item in a meeting was what I've always had in my head, that you go in and it says, oh, this has been done, this hasn't been done, this has half been done, this is due by then because otherwise that can't happen. So the, that sort of concept. Uh, I'm glad you asked the question, Lisa. I'm Mallory uh, from the Epic team and I am so excited for you to actually get to see Epic. Um, I think one of the things that we're really excited about for the direction sessions that are coming up in uh, March and April that Peter mentioned earlier and also some of the engagement sessions that Rowan and our team have been working on planning um, is an opportunity for you to see it. Um, in Epic, we have a couple of things that I'll highlight as starters and then you'll get so much more information, but. Um, the first is probably the patient storyboard. So those critical things that you always need to know, we've designed and we redesigned this about five years ago because of your feedback, because we had clinicians saying, man, this is pretty good, but it's not quite right. Um, we, so we redesigned it and we have a, a patient storyboard that wherever you are, whoever you are, whatever department you're in, you always have the patient storyboard. And included in that are those key things that can't get lost. Those are the things that tr they transcend um, episode, event, encounter, uh, person. Uh, those are those things that are the most important, always in your storyboard. We have a couple of different things from a um, clinical perspective. So we have the thing, it's called the nurse brain, um, which is sort of your task list of all of the things that can't get lost and the documentation about how they get done and how far they're done. Um, phys uh, pharmacists have access to that so they can see. Um, that's also attached to our longitudinal medication record called the MAR. We use a lot of acronyms, so I'm sorry in advance, but uh, you'll get to see all of those things, but the, the MAR also does some of that longitudinal tracking and then it all kind of wraps it into the single patient view. 
Um, there is a lot of other things that have tick boxes and appropriate recording fields and flags and red colors when they're wrong um, or amber colors when you're getting close to missing um, a next step that you needed to take at a certain time. But I think that storyboard along with some of those other tools really do a lot of what you're talking about. Um, I think to Nick, to your point though, some of those specifics are really important for us as we go through this, Im this implementation process. So if you know in your units, you've had struggles with these three things over and over again, you're like, how do we keep missing this? Um, bring those things up because we want to make sure that if those are things that have historically been a problem, we're, we're really intentional about flagging those also. I don't know, hopefully that helped answer your question. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. And I'm, I'm also very, very looking forward to spending five minutes looking at where things are at for that patient rather than the half an hour, 40 minutes that I take when I go and do a consult and trying to track through, especially the long stay patients. And you're trying to go back through and you discover three weeks back this fantastic summary, often from the ID specialists, mm -hmm. um, where... Look at that flattery. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Where, um, you know, there's all this detail. Well, it's because I'm an ex-ED physician, you see. I'm a concept, not detail person. Um, and there's all this detail, but then it hasn't been transferred. So, yeah, it, yeah that's very exciting. Uh, Peter mentioned that Mayo Clinic thing. Uh, that was actually one of the things that we worked on really, really hard. Um, at the same time we were designing the storyboard is they, they're seeing sometimes the most complex patients that many of the surrounding health care organizations are seeing. And uh, I, I have many people that I'm sure would love to talk to you about what has worked and what hasn't. Um, but uh, that is something too that I think over time we've done a really, we weren't always good, great at it. And sometimes you make decisions that make it not so great. And sometimes we'll tell you that's a bad decision. You shouldn't do that. Um, but a lot of times you'll come up with a really great idea and something creative that we'll want to add. Wonderful. Look, thanks for that, Mallory. Um, next question from the audience. Thank you for this um, symposium. Um, my name's Seyma. I'm one of the residents at the Canberra Hospital. Um, thank you, Nick, for mentioning roadblocks. I think just looking around, I'm probably the only junior doctor uh, here today and I was just wondering whether you had any thoughts about uh, how we can engage the junior doctor community um, in getting on board with the DHR. Thank you, Soma. Uh, that's such a pertinent question and you and I had the same thought and I was furiously trying to copy the Vimeo link into the um, JMO WhatsApp group but it turns out that the security protocols um, <laughs> prevented me from doing that. I don't have an app for that. Lingo's coming in a couple of months. <laughs> um, but, but, I mean, it's a, it's a serious thing because I, I had the, the, the same thought. I did try and do that. And then I thought, we need to actually use this as a case study. How many, um, you know, how many junior doctors are watching this online? Um, how many were actually aware of it? I'll ask these questions at the webinar uh, on, uh, on Wednesday. But then there is the um, improving medical engagement and communication strategy. So we do have regular webinars. This, like hand hygiene, will be the first two slides going forward until it uh, until it's finished. Um, we need to um, we need to work out some communications um, etiquette. I mean, you know, we, we've got lingo coming up. That's actually um, a, a priority. But going in lingo um, uh, sort of merges with Epic because Epic's got the same functionality. So as a um, as a junior doctor, and I, it's, things have changed. Um, but um, the only thing that was, was useful about a pager was that even though it was buzzing, you could at least have the choice that what you were doing needed to be prioritised. Whereas this is just going to give you a stack of information and tasks and things to do. And we've really got to um, work together, particularly um, ward nursing staff and junior medical officers and also senior medical officers, because we'll be contacted and been doing the contacting, understand what our communications etiquette is. So one of the things that I'd really like to hear from, um, from the EPIC team is have other institutions around the world face that problem of information overload, task overload, and that sort of thing. It's just one example. But for the future, though, for the future doctors and nurses coming through the universities, they would have been, they'll all be exposed to EPIC and the, and the electronic me medical record from the first.
year of nursing and medicine right through until they graduate. So that transition for our future workforce in the health arena, as well as allied health, uh, will be de a decrease because they'll have their own a unique identifier and um, and it will be, they'll have a greater appreciation of, of the benefits because it will be part of their curriculum. I'd just like to add as well, I think from a um, design perspective, I'm really hoping that the um, as we go and, and build this out, we're really able to um, leverage the fact that some of the, the more junior people, some of the some of the younger among us, um, where our brains have in, in some way started to change. We don't they, they call it like the Google effect, the Googleification. It's it's we don't remember the information itself so much as where to go to find the information. So a system like Epic, where the information has to be somewhere. The more that the, the juniors can be involved with setting up that ontology or the knowledge graph or whatever else, how the data model essentially for where information is going to be, the more they can be involved, the better the system is going to be. Mm. Absolutely. And look, I think Rowan Essex, who will be outside taking questions afterwards, also has been focusing on this a lot with sort of how do we sort of engage um, because they are the, 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 the backbone of our workforce and they will be um, becoming our seniors very soon. Um, got time for two last questions that I'm going to wrap up. So first of all, one from the audience and I've got one more from online. Yeah. yeah. So my name is Elijah Maham. I'm from Calvary Hospital. I work with Robin. Um, the question is just to Mallory. And um, healthcare is quite new into the cyberspace. Um, the banking sector and the various other um, organizations have had their own dealings with ransomware. So just wondering, over the years you guys have been operating, this is not specific to just ACT, now all of a sudden we are moving most of our transactions to um, online, and then we get a ransom. Have you had experience in that? Or I'm sure you're prepared for that, Peter. But just saying that if it happens tomorrow, have you had experience? Uh, what are the kind of things in place for that? Yeah. And while Mallory gets the microphone, I might start and say we've there's probably more money spent in the healthcare sector and the ACT government on cyber security than the rest of the ACT government combined three or four times over. Mm -hmm. um, and so look, it is a really, a thing that we do take very seriously. Am I spending enough money on it? No. The answer is you can probably never really spend enough money in cyber security, but it is a very big focus of what we're doing. And we now have a team of about eight people who that's all they do all day, every day. But Mallory knows far more about the, the joys that Epic have dealt with with some very special people over the years. They're all special, Peter, all of them. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a great question. I think uh, a, a couple of things that I think are probably most pertinent and then I can share a little bit of our experiences. Um, we, as a part of our software development life cycle, we actually do um, security testing and s security design reviews at each stage in the uh, development life cycle. Um, we have the gamut of independent auditors. We have a team at Epic who, uh, similar to the eight that Peter has, uh, we they just work on trying to break into Epic. Um, so finding all of the ways to try and uh, do bad things. Um, in summary, um, we so we we work through that on a on a regular basis. We'll uh, keep you informed if we ever see any potential vulnerabilities, um, and provide you support um, and or coding coding to fix it. Um, so I think just fundamentally that's part, that's built into who, who we are and how we develop. Um, we have seen a couple of groups be impacted by overall ransomware attacks. They typically are actually not coming to direct to Epic. Um, so some other part of their healthcare network mm. is uh, being impacted. Yeah. Um, one time I uh, was working with a group who ended up getting, uh, they were attacked, they had a ransomware attack and we shut everything down um, while they could figure out what to do and we sent a team of people out there to help them and it actually, none of their Epic data was breached. Um, it wasn't uh, anything through Epic but it affected their whole network and they were worried that something would happen. Um, so we have certain protocols depending on what happens. Um, we've worked with many groups who've been in various stages. And uh, interestingly, in this region, um, I have found that the world is in various stages of acceptance of the changing security needs in the industry, even within healthcare. Um, so talking to one of your peers and your counterparts in Singapore, you will get a different uh, perspective on security and the st stringent me measures that need to happen than you might from a peer at CUA at Cambridge um, with Keith and Afsal or another group even at Parkville. Even at Parkville, you'll hear something a little bit different. So 
I'd say in general, it's a very important thing to us. Um, it is part of what we do every day. We have lots of procedures and opportunities to support you if for some reason you were to be impacted. Um, in my decade of working at Epic, uh, we haven't had a uh, meaningful breach that wasn't caused by a disgruntled employee at the customer site or um, somebody intentionally doing something malicious from within the organization. Um, so that's probably the best uh, assurance I can give you today. And, and the last thing probably to add is that um, in the next month or two, we actually stand up a dedicated 24-7 uh, security operations centre. So part of the work we've been doing with actually going live with Epic is also working on getting new hosting arrangements. So we're actually moving to what we're calling the Health Protected Enclave, our own separate secured hosting environment um, that's hosted using a whole range of very um, sensitive things that do a whole lot of things. Not really going to talk about those in this big open forum. Happy to have individual chats outside where I'm not being recorded and broadcast on the internet. <laughs> Suffice to say, however, we will have a, um, we've got an outsourced 24-7 eyes on glass, people sitting there watching for alerts and triggers constantly, in addition to the team that we have inside ACT Health, in addition to the team that shared services have, and in addition to the team and the support we get from Epic as well. So nothing is ever perfect, but I can assure you it's a very large part of the focus of my day-to-day -day job. Um, so one very last question, which I might We'll spend two minutes on only, um, and Rowan, I might call on you to, to also be part of the answering of this one, given we've had lots of conversations about this. Um, in the US um, emergency departments, there is concern about the negative effects of um, digital health records and data entry on clinician wellbeing. How are we planning to avoid that in this implementation, the overload of clinical documentation? Yeah, you're not planning on answering that question at all, are you, Peter? No, um, <laughs> but Nick might. <laughs> the, it, is, it is a known issue with digital health transformation um, that there is a dip in, in, in clinician, um, and we're not just talking about doctors, um, happiness. And we saw, we saw that on all the um, graphs up there. Look, uh, a huge focus is uh, this... Uh, change management, training, getting people familiar with the system, realistic expectations. Um, and I am, we do plan, and we've touched on this, Nick, to, um, we do need to deliberately try and throttle activity a little bit um, as we go live, just so to take the pressure off. We're all pretty much on our limits day to day anyway. Uh, we can't do that and something new. Just pull it back. It doesn't have to be 50%, but a touch. I know Epic don't like us to do this, but literally every site we've spoken to has planned this, uh, and none of them have said it's a bad idea. It, two to four weeks, I, I think, is enough to get people over that, my God, what am I looking at? Um, there will be clinicians who uh, do not want to change, um, and they will always be a challenge and probably unhappy. Um, uh, my job is to work with them one-on-one, -on -one, I guess. So does anyone else want to add to this one while I completely dodge it? <laughs> an important factor is that the, um, the benefits need to accrue to the people that are doing the extra work. Otherwise, there's no motivation to keep continuing to do that work. So as long as that's a design principle that's taken forward as we go through this process, I think um, people will come around relatively quickly. Last thing, and then I will give it back to you, Peter. Uh, this is a really important part where we need your help. Uh, so we design uh, the foundation system, your initial workflows, and they're designed to be uh, efficient and to have people documenting things one time. Um, but sometimes we don't know uh, exactly who at your organization used to document that. So one of the things we've found over, the over our time implementing is sometimes we assume somebody is the person who normally does that documentation and in reality they don't. So they might feel they have an uh, a larger burden than others to carry when we actually get into the, the stage of using Epic. Um, so it'll be really important that you're, you all stay engaged in that process. And if, 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 as we're going through a workflow, you say, oh, wait a minute, I'm thinking about that. And Susie, my, you know, my colleague who triages my patients before I see them, she's always the one who puts that information in, not me. Uh, we need you to say something. So we make sure that we're not inappropriately moving burden from 
one part of your workforce to another. In some cases, it makes more sense to transition, but by taking one thing on, you can give one thing maybe to somebody else um, and, and do that balance. But we'll need you to help us understand that as we get through the system design also. <laughs> Can't help myself. One final thing there is there will be efficiencies. Um, there are certain parts, and transcription might be, jumps out as a huge area where um, uh, I think it was Melbourne noticed a 90% reduction in their transcription. Um, their, the organisations need to be somewhat agile um, and potentially redistribute some of that resource to the, the bottlenecks, which might be the patients arriving in uh, ED, now they need all their medications entered, whereas previously it was a scribble. So, It'll be a learning exercise for us all, but um, and change is coming. And on that note, um, before Rowan gets the microphone, I think we'll get it cut off now. Um, I'd like to sort of, first of all, thank everyone for attending today. Thank all the panellists and the speakers throughout the day or this afternoon. Um, I've run woefully over time, which is, I think, good, though, because there's lots of discussion. There's lots of questions we haven't answered. So next steps from here. First of all, for those that missed a presentation or missed some of the slides or didn't get a photo, or didn't get to ask a question, we'll be sharing all of this online, um, which will be available for you to share with anyone, uh, and we'll be promoting it very widely across the public health system. So all of the talks, all the slides, um, a couple of videos that were there that we, we didn't really get to play, we'll share all this content with you. I've got a whole list of questions here we didn't get to ask speakers and panellists. We'll get answers for all those and share that as well. But very much please recognise this is just the beginning of this trip. There will be lots of chance for you to all become engaged. And as we've heard from everyone, I think the more engaged we all are, the more we're going to implement something that actually fundamentally makes the lives of you as clinicians better, but also improves the outcomes for the patients that you deal with day in and day out and the reason why you became a clinician in the first place. So can I say to everyone, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you to everyone who's been involved in, in speaking and, and sharing their thoughts and travelling and Afsal, who I woke up at sort of four in the morning to come and talk to us this morning. Um, thank you so much. For those who are online, I'm terribly sorry. The food and drink that's here, I can't send virtually down the wire to you. Downside of not being here. For everyone who's in the room this afternoon at ANU, uh, we have some food and drink straight outside. So I wish you all a lovely evening and uh, thank you again. <laughs>